September 15th, 2020, a regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Will the clerk please call the roll? Good morning. Good morning, I'll call roll call. Supervisor Leopold? Here. Friend? Friend? Let's try this one more time. What? Uh. No, they're on. We're having audio issues. If you'd give us a second. I can hear now. It was working. <clears throat> Wasn't... Okay, thank you for that. We'll try one more time. Okay. <laughs> I'll call roll call. Supervisor Leopold? Here. Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. McPherson? Here. Chair Caput? Here. <laughs> okay. Uh, if we could have a moment of silence and prayer followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Consideration of late additions, uh, do we have any? Good morning, Chair Caput. Yes, we have a number of revisions. So on item number seven on the regular agenda, we have additional materials. There's a revised memo, packet page 16 with clean and strike through underlined copies, attachment S, planning staff response to PCPA. There's an insertion after package page 432. On item eight, there's a correction. Attachment B title should read resolution approving application 181604 CEQA exemption exhibits one through two. On item 10, there are additional materials. There's a revised memo packet pages 499 through 500 with clean and strikeout underlined copies. On the consent agenda item 16, there's additional materials. Revised attachment G, packet page 577. There are clean and strikeout underlying copies. We also have an addenda to the consent agenda. Item 52 is to approve an agreement with BitFocus Incorporated in the amount of $276,620 to provide software licenses for the Clarity Homeless Management Information System and related administrative, technical, and data support and take related actions as recommended by the county administrative officer. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, do uh, any board members uh, wish to pull a consent item and put it on the regular agenda? I don't hear anything, so we'll go to public comment. Uh, first, uh, Supervisor Coonerty would like to introduce invited testimony regarding Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. Supervisor uh, Coonerty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, September is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. Um, and I'm proud to do a proclamation and do it in partnership with uh, County Clerk Gail Pellerin and Behavioral Health Director Eric Riera, who are here today. Um, as many people know, while we face these large scale, very public uh, crises, um, thousands of people face a private crisis every day, um, considering and attempting uh, suicide. It's the second leading cause of death for those between the ages of 10 and 24. Uh, it especially impacts vulnerable communities, LGBT communities. Uh, and um, while there are policy actions we can take, one of the most important things we can do as people is to reach out to each other, check in, and make sure uh, that 
that we're giving people the support that they need. Uh, and we're fortunate to have uh, a, a leader across our county, County Clerk Gail Pellerin, here to speak to this item. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, board members, for the opportunity to speak to you today. I especially want to thank Supervisor Coonerty for proclaiming September as Suicide Prevention Awareness Month in Santa Cruz County. My name is Gail Pellerin, and I'm the county clerk, but today I'm speaking as a member of our community whew, on a topic that's profoundly personal to me and my children, Emily and Jacob. Suicide was not a topic I spent much time thinking or talking about before November 19th, 2018, when my husband Tom, the father of our two children, died by suicide. The past 22 months, I've learned a lot about suicide. I met ma many amazing people who have been impacted by suicide and I'm motivated to speak openly and publicly because there's a stigma associated with suicide that has got to end. I'm not an expert on the subject, like my colleague Eric and his coworkers, along with many other outstanding local and national organizations who are on the front lines of a battle that many still refuse to discuss in public. Suicide and mental illness remain difficult topics about, about which to speak openly, but everyone should understand that throughout life's struggles, and we all know we've had many in 2020, we all need the occasional reminder that we are all silently fighting our own battles. I no longer use the words committed suicide. You commit crimes. You do not commit an illness. You would not say someone committed cancer. Instead, I say died by suicide or took their own life. I also no longer believe suicide is a selfish or cowardice act. Suicide is possible when someone is in a very dark, painful, hopeless place and they lose their fear of death. The statistics are daunting. Supervisor Coonerty spoke of some of them. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the US. It's the second leading cause of death for our young people. There is one death by suicide in the US every 12 minutes. We've been here in this room for 12 minutes today. More than 48,000 people died by suicide across the United States in 2018, more than twice the number of homicides. In 2018, 1.4 million people attempted suicide. Firearms are the most common method of death by suicide. And in Santa Cruz County, the suicide rate is 16.4 per 100,000 residents compared to 10.7 statewide. Suicide does not discriminate. It impacts all people of all ages, genders, race, ethnicity, incomes, and sexual orientations but suicide numbers are higher for white males, active military and veterans, elderly, LGBTQ youth, and transgender adults. Depression is a leading cause of suicide. However, 80 to 90% of people who seek treatment for depression are treated successfully using therapy and or medication. So we need to talk about mental health a lot more, and we meet, need to make sure people have access to treatment. I've been participating in the local WINGS suicide support group for almost a year now. At each meeting, we go around the room or we're on the computer now via Zoom, and we introduce ourselves. We say the name of the person we lost and how our loved one died. Listening to their stories is sobering, our stories. As new people come into the group, my heart aches for their pain and sadness to be a member of a group that no one ever wanted to join. And some have been in this group for years, decades, and when they speak of their loss, it feels so recent and so raw. The grief never goes away. You just learn to live with it. You see, when a loved one dies by suicide, a parent, a child, a spouse, a sibling, a family member, a coworker, a friend, there's a sudden and unexpected hole in your life that leaves you in shock. When someone else kills your loved one, you can direct your anger and pain at that perpetrator. You have an enemy. 
But when it is the person you love who is the responsible party for taking their own life much too soon, there is confusion, profound sadness, and loss on how to deal with your emotions. Sometimes friends and family think it's time to get over it, time to move on. But with suicide, there's no moving on from the grief. You simply must pick it up and carry it with you. And for me, I have been inspired to put my grief to work, which is why I'm here today. So I have a few things I want to achieve. I want all of us to recognize that suicide is a public health crisis. I would like the county to provide suicide prevention training for our county employees. I urge schools to make sure parents have information about suicide prevention, and I encourage parents to talk to their children often about their mental health. I hope all of us, no matter what line of work we do, will take some time this month to talk to our coworkers, our students, our clients about suicide awareness and prevention. I would like to see the It's Okay to Ask for Help poster and that provides other help, light lines, help, help, help hotlines to be posted in public bathrooms. By the way, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 1-800-273-TALK, which is 8255. I want to encourage everyone here in this room or listening in to take the time to ask about the well-being of your family, your friends, your neighbors over the next few days and to genuinely convey your appreciation for their existence by any gesture you seem uh, that you deem appropriate. A simple phone call, a message, a COVID safe contact can go a long way toward helping someone realize that they can keep on going. So on that note, I wanna express my appreciation to each and every one of you here in this room. The County Board of Supervisors, my county coworkers and the members of the public Thank you for being here. I, for one, am very glad that you exist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Good morning. My name is Eric Riera and I'm the County Behavioral Health Director. I wanna thank the Board of Supervisors this morning for supporting this proclamation. And I especially wanna thank Ms. Pellerin for sharing the story of, of both herself and her family's experience, their direct experience with suicide. It's so critical to bring the issue of suicide out of the shadows and into the forefront. We as a community are committed to supporting the residents here in Santa Cruz County our behavioral health services remain committed to be available to support the community. And throughout all of the different challenges that we faced in the last six months, we've remained available to provide support, to provide whatever support is needed to help those who are in crisis. I wanna remind the public that they can go to our website, santacruzhealth.org there's contact information on that website about how to get in touch with us. We are available 24 hours a day to provide crisis assessments and support. And I, again, wanna thank the board for supporting this proclamation. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you Hey, good morning. My name is Drew Lewis. Uh, I got some good news for you today. The CDC lowers the uh, Corona-19 death count. On September 1st, 2020, the CDC Center for Disease Control recently and quietly revised their COVID-19 death count from 161,392 to 9,682 for the US population of 327 million, which is a real mortality rate of 0.0000296%. The mortality of the seasonal flu for 2017 in the US was 20, 21,000 to 52,000, which is double that of the Corona-19 with a real mortality rate of 0.006%. The entire global economy was locked down, populations forced to wear masks, social distance, stay at home, lose their jobs and businesses, experience spikes in suicides, drug abuse, domestic violence for a disease that has a far lower mortality than the seasonal flu. You might wanna think about that for a moment. 
And another thing to think about is that the federal court recently ruled against these lockdowns. A judge writes, quote, the lockdowns imposed are unprecedented in the history of our country. They have never been used in response to any other disease in our history. They were not recommendations by the Center for Disease Control. They were unheard of by the people of this nation until just this year. It appears as though the imposition of lockdowns in Wuhan and other areas of China, a nation unconstrained by civ concern for civil liberties and constitutional norms, started a domino effect where one country and state after another imposed draconian and hitherto untried measures on its citizens. The judge says more and ends with this, quote, the solution to a national crisis can never be per permitted to supersede the commitment to individual liberty that stands as the foundation of the American experience. experiment. The Constitution cannot accept the concept of a, quote, new normal, unquote, where the basic liberties of the people are subordinated to open-ended emergency mitigation measures. Rather, the Constitution sets certain lines that may not be crossed, even in an emergency. Actions taken by defendants cross these lines. It is the duty of the court to declare these actions unconstitutional. And you can expect that this is gonna come and be presented to you as well for these unconstitutional acts against our liberties. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me preface this. Uh, now is the opportunity for the uh, members of the public to address the board regarding topics on today's agenda, consent items, closed session agenda, and topics that are not on the agenda but within the jurisdiction of the board. It also, if you cannot stay later to speak on the regular agenda item, you may address those items at this time, but you may only speak once on a topic. So thank you. And uh, how many people do we have that want to speak? Okay. If uh, we'll, we'll go for, uh, if you have, if you need the whole three minutes, uh, try to let those people go first, and then we'll try to limit it to two minutes for somebody who wants to make a brief comment. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, my name is Judy Rosella Myers, and um, I've lived in this county for a very long time. I served a whole year on the civil grand jury, and. Um, this topic of suicide prevention is really important to me. And um, I didn't really know what I was gonna speak to today until I saw that that was the proclamation for today. And um, one of the special issues that we did as the civil grand jury that, that year was specifically investigating uh, the youth of our county and why there was so much drug usage. And a lot of that had to do with depression and unhappiness within their lives and dissatisfaction. And one of the troubling statistics that I just heard in the last few weeks was that school age children actually 33% because they are not able to attend school are having signs of depression. They are at home. They are not always helped um, in the ways that they need to be because their parents are not necessarily available all the time, which was exactly the same th issue that we found with the overuse of drugs in our community, you know, when I served on the civil grand jury. And I feel like that it's so important to address this issue and nip it in the bud with all the rules and regulations from the COVID-19 lockdown issues, not just for us adults, but for the children of our community that have suffered a great deal because they can't socialize. And it's so important for us to think of creative ways to now deal with where we are right now. And hopefully you all and you know anybody who's working on this issue can come up with creative ways to help our youth as well as our seniors. I know more seniors who've committed suicide this year than in my entire life. 
So please, please, please try and help this issue. Thank Liberate you. us so we can be free to be ourselves. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the Board of Supervisors, Mr. Chairman, and greetings to all the supervisors here or not. My name is Abby Young, and I represent, um, I live in Prospect Heights, and I represent the first certified FireWise group in Santa Cruz County. And I'm now mentoring a group of communities for FireWise in the city and county that encompass Prospect Heights, Western Ave, Highland Ave, Par uh, Paradise Park, Woodland Heights, Redwood Cathedral, Larson, and Arroyo Canyon. This is a very important community effort to protect our, ourselves from fire, fire preparedness. As a group and as your consist, constituents, we would like to bring to your attention the grand jury report on fire risk that was issued July 3rd, 2020. That was prior to the CZU complex fire. We would like to express our deep concern and our finding uh, at the findings in this report and want you to know that we unanimously support its many urgent recommendations to improve fire organization and community safety in the county. The report observes among other things that quote, the grand jury found little evidence that essential information and data required to effectively manage fire risk in the county was available to operational managers who have the responsibility to minimize the impact of wildfire. It goes on to say, no one entity in the county is performing a leadership role in fire hazard mitigation. Thus, the lines of authority from leadership to performers are not clearly defined, making accountability dif difficult. The report lists six categories of investigation, all which demonstrate major deficiencies, and it requests re response from the counties the cities and fire districts within 90 days, and that's coming up in October. The six categories are fire organization, risk and mitigation, emergency response, alerts and evacuation, education, and importantly, governance and transparency. The findings and recommendations of the grand jury report are issues of life and death for your constituents and many here today may have uh, experienced those, that situation of losing a loved one or a home. We urge you to give these matters your most serious consideration and to find the means to restructure the fire organization of Santa Cruz County as recommended in the grand jury report. And I have a report I'd like to submit along with a chart and letters from my constituents. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership, Abby. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Malia Powell. I'm a supervising staff attorney with Senior Citizens Legal Services, and I'm going to address line item nine because I can't stay for that agenda item. Um, my professional life is dedicated to helping the seniors in our community remain housed. And I am also a resident of Last Chance. My home recently burned down. Ah. Um, this is a unique instance where my professional life and my personal life have converged because my home wasn't the only one to burn down. My mother's farm of 30 years that she has tended also burned down. And my neighbors homesteads that they've lovingly built over generations have burned down as well. And many of my neighbors are now low income seniors. They're landowners but they have a very difficult time rebuilding these homesteads that they've spent their lives on. Generations live on these homesteads and they are utterly beautiful. They were utterly beautiful. I wish I could show you pictures of what we had. I don't have them. <laughs> um, so luckily for all of us, as you probably know, the state of California respected communities like ours and passed legislation in the 80s um, under Title 25, California Code of Regulations, Article 8, that allowed counties like Santa Cruz 
to support communities, unique communities like Last Chance. So I hope that you all are ready and willing to work with us so that we can rebuild our very unique part of Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I've been a resident of this county since 1994. Um, I think I'm usually a pretty good citizen, although probably one of the best compliments I've been given by a young person was, how's it going, hooligan? So I think humor is really important. I'm gonna talk about domestic, national, and world terrorism going on right now. So for example, what I'm holding in my hand is a set of straws, but it's actually four pairs of magnets. And if you align them, the south's going together, the north's going together, north and south, and then south going, and the south's going together. It aligns the water in such a way that has many healthful benefits. The biggest benefit that one can notice if they align their water like this is after three or four months, most of your gray hair will go back to its normal color. Now, I have yet to experience this, but I have more gray hair than you can see. Um, I want to be positive and playful and have a sense of uh, positive purposefulness, but you know, putting this configuration together on your water meter will cause the smart meter to turn off. So that could be considered an act of domestic terrorism, but that's not actually why, what I'm here to talk about. Over the weekend, I had an opportunity to go into the Santa Cruz Mountains to a place that I lived at in 2013 and 2014, up off Alba Road. And I was very pleased that five of the neighbors that I knew, their houses hadn't been burned to the ground. But um, the house that I lived in, and the other accessory unit, it was burned to the ground. And this is, this kind, these kinds of fires are seen all over the world. And um, it's really kind of sad because there are entities that direct the US Congress when they're in their summer session as to what they're gonna vote on and what they're gonna, and what are of interest to them. And I can say that I can make observations in other public communities where decisions are being made. And I find that quite unfortunate. Um, there's a great deal of information on this. I suppose I could mention the name of the corporation that was established in 1948 that controls the US military and other militaries. And they completely have captured the US Congress and it's trickled down to all areas of, of public leadership. And it's really quite sad. So by my direct observations, and from what I know, these fires are not natural. And when we had the fires that started in Santa Cruz about a month ago, other storms were going on in the United States. And a week ago, the whole West Coast caught on fire. Right now, there's an unnatural hurricane going on in Florida. And so there's a lot of events going on. And I'm here, and I'm very glad that I can still speak. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tony Crane. Uh, for the past three years or so, I've come here in opposition to the second story program that was implemented in our neighborhood. Um, I think now I'm just going to address dishonesty. So when they put this uh, program in our neighborhood, uh, that was to house uh, hundreds of guests per year, uh, who suffer from uh, mental illness uh, and, and in crisis. So I'm not opposed to helping the mentally ill. Um, in fact, I know we have a severe problem here in Santa Cruz and that we need to do it and we need to do it efficiently. However, when we addressed what was going on, we, it was very clear that everybody involved was being dishonest. So uh, we had a meeting and at that meeting, they lied to us over and over again. That included Mr. Eric Riera, who was the, the leader of uh, the implementation of this. And uh, when, we, when we knew that they were being dishonest, we uh, went out and uh, got their internal emails between the county and the, um, the contractor that was gonna run the program. These emails show very clearly that they were intentionally being dishonest from day one, uh, and actually 
months in advance. And they bought this house, didn't tell anybody about it because they knew that if they were honest about what they were doing, it would never have passed through a public hearing and a level five permit review. So they continued to lie. I brought these directly to the Board of Supervisors. I've read the emails to you guys, and it's very clear that they're being dishonest. There's no question about it. Uh, over time, we addressed County Council. My opinion, County Council also lied. In fact, I know they did. I have emails where they made statements that were deceptive. They were misleading in order to keep the board and everybody else from legal trouble. And then most recently, the um, planning department was extremely dishonest and refused to receive a legal request from our community, claiming that they had the right, but they, they don't have the right. I've read the laws over and over again. So um, everybody knows, everybody who's read the emails knows, but you know, being that it's a touchy subject, people tend to fend away from it. But the general idea is that it's dishonest, the whole thing. And many laws were broken over time. If anybody wants to know about it, they can contact me anytime I've got the emails. And with the election coming up, I'm going to reassert myself and let everybody know what's going on. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Good morning. Today is actually my first day back from being evacuated out of Brookdale on I can just tell you from driving around and seeing my community, I can only ask that you pull item 19 on your agenda for the benefit of your whole community in the area of accessory structure, maximum height requirements. As a 30 year dedicated professional, co-compliance professional, both inside the county as a co-compliance investigator and outside the county as a designer with a license in California real estate. The state of California in the first of the year passed laws allowing not only ADUs, but JADUs for the first time. Many people are just learning of this ability that they now have to provide more housing. This law, this code that you're trying to change is going to prevent any existing building that's two story from being converted to an ADU or an existing one story detached structure from having an addition of an additional floor story to provide hope for now the 1,425 residences that have lost their homes. This law is, a, this code runs against counter to affordable housing, counter to your housing element, counter to your general plan to provide for affordable housing. You have 1,500 new homeless families. I don't know if you can see the, the accumulation that's beginning to occur, the homeless encampments that are starting. Please provide more hope for these people. Don't take away the ability for those who can help them, who have means to add to their properties for these people to take care of their friends like we all want to. Thank you very much for your support of the firefighters and the law enforcement staff that kept us from being looted. Thank you for your support for all the people in this county, but please help us as designers to be able to rebuild for these people. Don't put more hurdles in our way. Don't give us more design challenges. Please don't add to the levels of review. Please think about reducing fees instead of adding to them or eliminating them completely. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it completely as we try to rebuild our community that we love and enjoy so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Hello again, Monica McGuire. Uh, so sorry to hear Claire's empathy being unmet as usual. Um, it, there's so many people that are in the terrible place that she's talking about. And 
I know that you do, nobody can do everything wrong all the time and you do help some people sometimes. Um, and that confuses most people in this county into thinking that, well, you know, it's a mix, they can't do everything. But as we know, ignoring the fact that this is now supposedly Su Suicide Prevention Month and we have been asking since March, what are the numbers of people killing themselves over COVID? We got last two weeks ago, we got how many people were killing themselves with overdoses so vastly higher than the number that have died in this county, four times that number, and those aren't counted as suicide. So we, we have been asking for six months and gotten no answer. And no matter where I've turned, including to Mr. Riera as he left, what are the numbers? He said the same politically correct answer that we've received all along. It's so terrible what people are going through in this county, we know. Oh, sorry, we don't wanna give the number because we don't wanna mislead. We've asked for ballpark numbers. We've asked for any form of care about the people who are on the edge of suicide all of these six months because it's obvious that the measures put on this county, like there's 3,130 or so counties in this country, and 3,000 of them have uh, death rates as low as ours, 0.0026%. Many have even lower and no death rates. Everybody knows if they just think about it logically that the way to handle the 30 counties that actually have high numbers is to work on those counties, to work on making sure that people don't leave those counties and create bigger problems for other counties. But you didn't listen to us six months ago, so all the numbers of the collateral deaths have died, uh, have, have risen, of de deaths have risen. And you haven't acted as we've asked you to, like Placer County did. So Placer County, everybody at home, please look up their September 8th meeting because they did what we've been asking our supervisors who are entirely derelict of their duties with this to do. They actually brought in experts. We offered experts from the moment that this started in, in March. We've offered them for six months. All it takes is that you listen to experts, think about what's best for this county. Placer County did it and they finally had the guts to say, we've done everything we possibly can to see, and they're again, a very similar size to us, everything, that their ability to help the maximum number in their county depended on their actually studying what was needed for their county, listening to the people in their county, which you have entirely not done. You not only have never gone to anyone asking them what they need and want, but you have never used the chance to take input in the supposed town hall meetings that you've held online. Over and over, the comments are turned off and you don't allow anyone to ask questions. These are derelictions of duty that make no sense. Thank you. Uh, the clock started running before I even spoke. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of rural Aptos. I'm here to talk with you this morning as one of the people in your community leading a firewise community effort. I really applaud the efforts of Abby Young and she is really encouraging other people to, to take a grassroots approach and protect ourselves. We saw recently in the CZU that that's really what we have to do. So I am here to ask you as the board of supervisors in your response, this is speaking to consent agenda item 26, where you are delaying your response to the ready, aim, fire, Santa Cruz County in the hot seat grand jury, excellent, excellent report until October 6th. I am asking you to pay attention to centralized um, leadership and to coordinate efforts throughout the county. There exists a county emergency count management council. Ask them, have them put together a unified system of identifying fire risks and their mitigations. Bring in the fire chiefs association. Their meetings are closed to the public. Their website is closed to the public, but they can certainly join in on the County Emergency Management Council to help our county address these issues that are lacking. I would like to ask that that group create a work plan. Don't just give them a vague assignment and have it disappear. Now is the time to create an actual work plan and hold them to it. 
please appoint a county risk manager by the end of this year. Please fund and reinstate Rosemary Anderson's full-time position as our county's Office of Emergency Services Manager. It was shown when she was not in the county during the CZU fire and the CAO's office was in charge, there were a lot of problems. We need her or someone like her that is fully dedicated to this effort. We need to adopt a consistent data system throughout the county. We need to um, require quarterly and annual reports from Cal Fire and County Fire. There's a massive million dollar three year project your board just approved, but there is zero accountability from County Fire for that. And they do not recruit volunteers. They do not. I go to the Fire Department Advisory Commission meetings. It's brought up every time by the volunteers. Cal Fire is not doing their fiduciary and contract duty to recruit volunteers. Work with LAFCO to post ISO ratings for all areas of the county to assure that our insurance policies will not be canceled. Those, that information is not granular enough. And um, finally, please support financially the Fire Safe Council that you created in 2016 and now no longer fund. Those are the people that will do the work. Thank you. I'm one of 25 residents in my small community whose homes were completely destroyed in the fire. Our biggest issue right now is cleanup. Um, it looks like that EPA won't be done with the cleanup of the first phase one until nearly December 1st. We're well into rainy season. So the problem here is that the remaining toxic ash is going to wash down our mountain and into the San Lorenzo River. We need to greatly speed this up or we're gonna have a, the biggest pollution problem in Santa Cruz history after the biggest disaster in Santa Cruz history. This needs to be sped up, it needs to be sped up fast. There's lots of resources that you can use, but you gotta push the, the county departments to speed this process up. In the future, we can address the, the fees about rebuilding and the standards for rebuilding, but right now the immediate need is to clean this mess up. It's not gonna hurt me it's gonna hurt everybody downhill from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Doring, Senator Pro Temp, New, New State, California. Notice to all, all Californians. New California is a new state in development ex exercising its constitutional right to form from the state of California. <coughs> the process to form New California is authorized and codified in Article 4, Section 3, and Section 4 of the United States Constitution. The order of the day, arrest the governor. We, the people of the Uni United Counties of New California, will seek removal of California State Governor turned dictator, Gavin Newsom, and will pursue every means available to remedy the abuse and usurpation of power and seek restitution for the countless men, women, families, and businesses that have been harmed by his actions and the actions of his assigns. The general failure of the state of California to meet its financial obligations under the governor's term of office, the governor's role in exploiting the COVID crisis for his own benefit and the benefit of his party and associates. Additionally, the governor is guilty of application of onerous mandates and threats to the people of California state. Since the damages that have been incurred by the citizens is so great, rather than pursuing a recall through the petition process, we will be bringing up charges to every authority having jurisdiction. We will avail ourselves of every legal means that is at our disposal, including but not limited to grand jury procedures, appeals for investigations from federal authorities, for a commingling of funds, misallocation of funds, and financial and fiduciary mal with reference to the governor's role in the breach of trust that has occurred in the failure to comply with mandatory financial accounting procedures. Let it be known that we, the citizens of New California State, will seek all legal remedy, both criminal and civil, against those under the color of law, seek to enforce unconstitutional laws, also known as edicts by a lawless, tyrannical dictator, at whatever level of government or office 
they may occupy as well as seeking legal redress against the same lawless individuals issuing said unconstitutional edicts. The said and illegal unenforceable edicts are in direct conflict with the Constitution of the United States, specifically the First Amendment, in which Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The prevention of church services or services operating under owner's conditions or gathering of family and friends for funerals and emotional support. The gathering of family and friends for means of celebration in weddings and et cetera. Thank you. Chair, could you remind everybody that they have to wear their mask over their nose and their mouth as well? Um, I'm with, with Mark and I'm just gonna read a little more. Um, the fourth amendment. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. A person's right to determine if mask wearing is suitable for their and their children's health. Eighth Amendment, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted in the form of forced wearing of masks and social distancing. <clears throat> Keeping loved ones away from their family in hospitals or nursing homes. Fourteenth Amendment, Section 1, all persons born to naturalized <clears throat> in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law <clears throat> which shall abridge the persons or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law nor de deny to any person with its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. The above amendments, when they are violated by an officer of the law, by an official of the state, county, or city law, then those involved in the enforcement are subject <coughs> to Title 18, USC Section 242, of the United States Department of Justice. Title 18 U.S.C. Section 242. Whoever under co color of any law, statute, ordinance, regulation, or custom willfully subjects any person in any state, territory. Am I done? Or, no, we just can't do Oh. <laughs> willfully subjects any person in any state, territory, commonwealth, possession, or district to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured or protected by the, <clears throat> protected by the Constitution or laws of the United States shall be fined under this title or imprisonment not more than one year or both and if bodily injury results from the acts committed in violation of this section, or if such acts include the use, attempted use, or threatened use of a dangerous weapon. Am I done? Yes. You want to thank you. It up real quick? Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Holiday Smith and I am a member of the community of Last Chance, which as you know, on the night of August 18th, um, nearly every home in my entire community, around 70 homes were burned completely in a raging inferno that converged on our community. Um, and I'm here to speak to three points about my community. One is 
um, the beauty and value of our community. We are a very strong group of people, a very diverse group of people. We are a community with many backgrounds. We are engineers, we are teachers, we're highly educated. Um, we have some things in common too. We are very, very capable people. Um, and we are not just willing, but incredibly eager to rebuild our homes and our lives. I was born there. My family has lived there for nearly 50 years. Um, we are also very environmentally conscious. And um, yeah, I also wanted to speak to the importance of timeliness, which is incredibly crucial with the rains coming. Um, we are very concerned about cleanup and having the cleanup happen as quickly as possible. We are also concerned that the cleanup might start in places where access is easier and make it so that places where access is more challenging, like on our dirt road, won't end up being able to happen at all with horrific environmental consequences for our watershed if we wait into the winter. And it also will make it incredibly hard for us to rebuild. Um, obviously, uh, your body has a lot to do with our rebuilding process and we would love any and all support and help. We are willing to work with you. And that brings me to the final point I wanted to make, which is about communication. We have felt an absolute void of communication, both before and during the fire and certainly after the fire in terms of anyone reaching out to our community. We are off the grid. We have our own road association. And yet it has been incredibly hard to find out anything whatsoever about what is going on. Right now, we know perhaps from a CAL FIRE member of our community who lost his home that no one's even out there doing any work, and yet we don't even have any updates about when we might be able to return, when our elected road manager might be able to help with that work. And we are really eager to work with all of you um, and work with the other agencies involved in the cleanup and the rebuilding effort. Um, so any uh, efforts that can be made to include our community, we are people who are doers, would be incredibly appreciated, or at least to communicate with us. This is our entire lives. Um, and the last 10 seconds, as you know, we are in an absolute housing crisis. And we just lost a huge portion of the actual affordable housing in Santa Cruz County, certain in last chance in a huge part and in other parts of our county. And anything that can be done to, you know, bring that housing back is very, very important. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning. Hello. Um, my name is Gia Batchik. Uh, we also lost our home in Last Chance. It's ashes. Uh, the Last Chance community is a, a, a community of neighbors and friends that help each other. And we would like to get through this together. And uh, we appreciate any help from the county. We would appreciate if the permit expenses were lowered. We would appreciate uh, inspectors that would uh, kind of just like do all of us <laughs> instead of having everybody an individual inspector and then you have the luck of the draw. Are they tough or not? Um, we'd like to rebuild. It would be an asset to the county if we could rebuild. Uh, the taxes would go back up again. Um, I would also just like to say uh, I'm grateful to the county for the, uh, the fairgrounds, the evacuation center that was set up for us. We spent two and a half weeks in a tent there, but that meant that it was COVID-19 compliant. Everyone wore masks. The tents were the only places you could take them off. Uh, everybody was so kind there. The staff was wonderful. Any problem you had, they were willing to address. The volunteers were like angels. Um, they provided us with clothing even, as well as meals. And so I just wanted to say that that was very well done by the county and uh, very much appreciated. And especially by the last chance people that ended up there in, in a terrifying situation. Thank you very much.
Good morning. Uh, first off, I'd like to just commend everyone who's spoken today and everyone else in the community who has come together to help each other. We're facing so many different things coming at us from all these different angles, and I just really want to commend all of our community members helping each other through the fires and through all the restrictions and things with the lockdown as well and trying to support each other's businesses and families and get through all of this. Uh, I'd like to speak to something very quickly, and that is the fire rings on the beaches. We are right now seeing our beaches being ruined by piles of coal and ashes all over the beaches because the fire rings were taken away and not returned. Uh, it's very clear that uh, your constituents have made their voices heard by their actions, which is that humans want to sit around fires. Humans have been sitting around fires and talking forever, and perhaps many more things could get done if we went back to that on a regular basis. Um, so please bring the fire rings back. This is ridiculous the beaches are being ruined. Um, <clears throat> especially uh, Twin Lakes Beach is really just becoming horrible. Okay. Um few other topics here. On September 9th, the Placer County Board of Supervisors voted five to zero to end their local health emergency, declaring that the anticipated overwhelm of services had not happened. Sounds familiar to hear, yes? The projected deaths were vastly overstated and the conditions present at the time of the emergency declaration based on these false projections no longer applied. Be nice if we could do that here. These same conditions are true in Santa Cruz County. Why are you continuing a fraudulent local emergency that no longer exists? In my understanding of the law, this is illegal. And I'm reading this um, for a friend. Uh, on Monday, 914, a federal judge ruled that the Pennsylvania lockdown and essential non-essential business rules are unconstitutional. The judge wrote, the Wolf administration's pandemic policies have been overreaching and arbitrary and violated citizens' constitutional rights. The lockdowns imposed are unprecedented in the history of our country. They have never been used in response to any other disease in our history. They were not recommendations by the CDC. They were unheard of by the people of this nation until just this year. It appears as though the imposition of lockdowns in Wuhan and other areas of China, a nation unconstrained by concern for civil liberties and constitutional norms, started a domino effect where one country and state after another imposed draconian and hitherto untried measures on their citizens. The solution to a national crisis can never be permitted to supersede the commitment to individual liberty that stands as the foundation of the American experiment. The Constitution cannot accept the concept of a new normal where the basic liberties of the people are subordinated to open-ended emergency mitigation measures. Rather, the Constitution sets certain lines that may not be crossed even in an emergency. Actions taken by de defendants cross these lines. It is the duty of the court to declare these actions unconstitutional. We gotta think about this, people. It's time to get back to reality. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Why is the U.S. the sickest country in the developed world? <clears throat> Why is the U.S. the fifth sickest country in the world? <clears throat> We're gonna look at Louis Pasteur versus Bouchamp. Louis, Louis Pasteur was a French scientist who came up with the germ theory. He himself was a germophobic. He thought that the udders of the cows that they used to milk for milk would contaminate him. A lot of things would contaminate him. So he tormented animals in his laboratory and he contrived his results. He hobnobbed with Francis Rich and Famous, glorifying these findings until his germ theory was utilized in what we call Western medicine. Then Bouchamp, another French scientist, came along not too much later, and he said, no, the germ theory is not what the problem is, it's the terrain, it is the environment, our internal and external environment. It's how we take care of both. <sighs> but, real, but finally, it was realized that money could be made on the germ theory. So medicines and vaccines were concocted to try to kill everything off. Most recently, more, more of the honest scientists and some of the MDs are talking about genomics. And genomics is a system of living in harmony 
with the thousands of viruses, bacteria, and fungus all around us. In fact, they make us stronger and healthy. We have virus-wise 10, 10 to the 31. That means 10 with 31 zeros behind it. Viruses in our air, water, soil, all around us at all times. Viruses are basically not living. Viruses cannot reproduce. They cannot absorb energy. They cannot give energy. They're basically pockets of information. So the biome, what we want to do instead of killing everything in our environment and in our bodies with medicines and vaccines is we want to strengthen our biome and our microbiome, which means tiny life. We want to live in harmony with it. Viruses and bacteria have been with us for probably the 20,000 years that we have, uh, we have been able to find carbon dated skulls. I ask you to consider looking at genomics, hygiene, washing your hands, eating organics, not using pesticides, which destroys the biome and the microbiome, dancing with nature, eating its herbs and plant foods. Thank you. And reducing radiation. Vaccines and viruses do not work. That's insane. We would have to continuously keep killing viruses and they keep mutating and changing to help us strengthen our system. Be respectful to the other people in the Thank room you who, who are looking to uh, testify Support as your well. microbiome. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Cove Britain, Matt's and Britain Architects. Um, Recently, I was made aware of a report and hopefully the supervisors received a copy of that report. I have requested a copy of that report and have not been given it, uh, but it was a county funded report regarding the permit processing. My understanding is the permit processing has a 98% rejection rate. I think this is something that needs to be shared with the public and discussed by the board. I, my understanding is one of the thoughts or reasons that planning is saying there's a 98% rejection rate is because applications aren't complete. Well, I can tell you the application process in the County of Santa Cruz is ridiculous. So of course they're not complete. You know, it, but again, the, this is specifically the request that that report be released. I asked the county CAO's office and the supervisors, but it's been definitely acknowledged that it exists. I also want to reinforce or <laughs> uh, support and commend uh, Ms. Claire Machado regarding item 19. And also the wish <clears throat> for all of us that are trying to build is to do it safely. We're liable and we want to do the right thing, but the process is onerous. I'll talk about two ADUs that I'm working on. It took over a year to process. One of them was tricky, I'll give that, but over a year to process for an ADU. I'm working on one now, should be easy, conversion of existing space. Shouldn't be a big deal. By the city of Santa Cruz rules, not a problem. And you're supposed to do it in 60 days, 60 days. You're supposed to have a building permit. I didn't get a response, the final response until one week before that 60 days. And there's corrections, you know, tons of corrections. Most of them are incorrect. We've already got some of them taken off, but the board really needs to take a personal interest and really reach out to the professional community and hear, not through the filter of planning, not through the filter of public works, that we are trying to help in this housing crisis, but it's immensely difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Gary. Hi, uh, Gary Richard Arnold. <clears throat> Many, you've been accused of misleading. I think there's no leading. I believe that's what, what's happening here is following the Panetta machine and lockstep. The, the, uh, 
so-called so disease is a fraud across the world. Uh, it began with lockstep with the Rockefeller Foundation in 2010. The operation uh, supposedly correcting it does not come from you or our elected representatives. In fact, Margaret Lopez is being paid by a secret billionaire and for none of you to give that billionaire's name shows collusion and conspiracy against the very people you pretend to represent. There are secret billionaires that have been trying to substantiate, transubstantiate elective government to a Soviet and you know it, you've been part of it, you've been part of AMBAG. Uh, this has been brought up. Uh, through the billionaire process at the University of Chicago, showing that your county administrative officers, your city managers are trained by billionaires like Marshall Field and Rockefeller. They don't represent you. They don't have to live in the community. They don't even have to be a citizen. Their promotion comes not from you, but from the next step up from some bigger city or some huge foundation. Uh, there's a secret society uh, called uh, that started five years before Skull and Bones, um, of which Charles Munger, who's been part of the Panetta machine, neutralizing Republicans up and down the state so they never bring up Panetta Gate. They never bring up Bruce McPherson's receiving $30,000. Or that his communication director advertises and promotes a separate communist country called Pacifica. Uh, none of that comes up. Uh, another part of that secret society was Earl Warren, who was in involved in the JFK murder. Another person of that secret society formed in 1847 was Henry Rathbone, who was in the booth with Lincoln when Lincoln was assassinated. Um, anyway, I can go on and on. The, uh, uh, Robert Harrison is the Goldman Sachs, of course, is the head of the Clinton Glo uh, Global Initiative. Uh, the first head of the California League of Cities is James Fellon, a member of Bohemian Grove, where they conduct annual cremations of care and burning children in effigy. And it was Jim Jones that provided the children for Bohemian Grove, for the San Francisco elite, and to blackmail the politicians of the state legislature. You're destroying uh, the self-government by design, by transferring your authority to AMBAG and making contracts with ICLE, which is a front for the World Bank and the UN. Carlos Palacios was a director of the foundation in which this Margaret Lopez was appointed as dictator. Now, he should be fired immediately as with the rest of the people that support uh, also Minnie Hall and Margaret Lopez belong to conflict of interest organizations, Minnie Hall with Johnson & Johnson and uh, Margaret Lopez with Permanente. You have no business doing those violations Thanks, of Jared. interest to our representation. Hi, I'm Mary Lee Sams Wiley. Again, want to re uh, report that six months, six weeks ago, a month ago, you all decided to um, eliminate the road clearing. We still have a problem. I did speak to someone at the road maintenance. They said that, yes, after um, this catastrophe was over, they were going to try and get higher out to an outside company to take care of the roads and to reduce the fire hazard. But time is of the essence to get that done now. We just something that needs to get done to prevent more fires that we're going to have. Also to um, reduce or no fees to remove invasive trees and the shrubbery around uh, to reduce that fu fuel reduction so that we can mitigate some of these fires from taking off into being catastrophic. Uh, Cal Fire has the information, chandelier trees, clear out the undergrowth and please have them please go out and order up online for winter rye, also known as annual rye, to be thrown out. It doesn't need um, fertilizer. You just throw it out there. The animals won't eat it. The roots will hold the soil to prevent erosion. All that ash with the water is going to turn to lye, uh, kill off a lot of stuff in the rivers and everything else. However, if you put out the winter rye, you're not going to have these massive landslides that are going to be coming to us in the wintertime. Appreciate your listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll we'll go downstairs. Hi there. Good morning. 
Your microphone's probably not on. Okay. Community room, now is your chance. Good morning. Hi, um, hi my name is Christina, and um, I am a resident of a fallen leaf neighborhood. And so I am echoing all the statements that the people in last chance just made about rebuilding and debris removal and cleanup. Um, I've sent many emails to the county so far, and every email is kind of put off, like with no direct answer. Um, I guess we need to fill out some type of reentry form for the cleanup, um, which is not on the website. And time is of the essence. We need to clean up before the rains come. We do not want to have our creeks and rivers polluted and our community polluted. So when is information going to come out? How is FEMA going to be helping us, supporting us? Is it going to be through the county, through the state? Um, you know, this is time is of the essence and we need to have some answers as soon as possible. So I just ask that our supervisor, Bruce, that you please address this. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Marilyn Garrett, am I on? The sound. Yes, can you hear me? yes Marilyn, you, we can hear you in chambers. Okay. You opened the meeting with Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month. What are some of the major causes of suicide that are not being addressed here? One cause we know is antidepressants. A friend of mine's 30-year-old daughter jumped off a cliff. She was taking Depakote. If you read the full printout on antidepressants, it states increased suicide rate or something of those words. Also, feeling sad and depressed, this doctor in his smock says, are you feeling anxious, worried about the future, feeling isolated and alone? you may be suffering from capitalism. And listen to these symptoms which have been exacerbated in recent times under the lockdown and disaster capitalism as it's called, also the age of surveillance capitalism. Symptoms may include homelessness, unemployment, poverty, hunger, feelings of hopelessness, fear, apathy, boredom, cultural decay, loss of identity, loss of free speech, incarceration, suicidal or revolutionary thoughts, death, symptoms of capitalism. Under this lockdown, and restriction of our rights, which I do think the evidence shows is unconstitutional. We have seen increased illnesses and deaths. Somebody who elaborates on that is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and see his website, Children's Health Defense. He showed how so many, he stated a study that showed how many more deaths there are with each increase in unemployment. And, and any public health policy that harms and causes more death in the population is an illegitimate and uh, you know, like a murderous policy. You need to lift this these, this lockdown and this whole policy under COVID. Thank you. So 
Hello, my name is Robert Salinas. I am from the Fallen Leaf community and I lost my house. Um, I hadn't originally planned on speaking today, um, but after seeing the lady who talked about Cal Fire, you know, turning their backs on volunteer strike forces to help to prevent uh, forest fires from spreading and so on, um, I kind of felt that I, I, I needed to speak because I know a number of people, myself included, within the community, if we could have, we would have, if we could have been allowed, we would have stepped up to try and fight and save our homes, save our community. And so I would like to actually ask the, the, the county to, if Cal Fire is, you know, isn't going to step up and create a volunteer strike force to help fight these forest fires in our communities when they do start, and we are a, a wooded community, so it's going to happen again, then why don't we create a county level strike force, volunteer force, and, and, and make sure that at least our community, our county is, is safe. If we can't count on the state, then we've got to do it ourselves. And so I, I think it's important for us at the, the county and even the city level to take responsibility for the safety of our community and I think this is, is one of the steps to it, is take ownership. Don't wait for CAL FIRE. Don't expect CAL FIRE to be there, save the day. They don't have the resources. End of story. So let's create our own resources. Thank you. Chair? We have a couple web comments. The first web comment is from Satya Orion. Major lawsuit has been filed against Ohio governor and state of Ohio for restricting freedom without legitimate justification. The case opens in recent months, entire states have been imprisoned without due process and with the clear threat to impose such lockdowns again. Interstate travel has been severely restricted Privacy rights have been devastated, numerous businesses taking without compensation, and many regulations being Im implemented without statutory process requirements under the guise of a health emergency that is roughly as dangerous as the seasonal influenza outbreak. The plaintiffs in the case have all been injured in, in various capacities by these unconstitutional actions and without action by the court <clears throat> will be left without redress. More terrifying without action by the court the court will be setting future precedent that will allow states to withhold fundamental constitutional rights in violation of U.S. Supreme Court precedent, circumventing the various levels of scrutiny applied to such rights, and justify such actions under public health emergency orders without subjecting those orders to any real review. Just trust the bureaucracies, I'm sorry, just trust the bureaucrats because they are the experts. Here is the most important point. We humbly ask the court in, the case, in this case to Recognize the political process and operative orders are invalid if based on false or misleading information. And recognize the, critical, the, the criticality that all future emergency orders be based on maintained on clear, honest facts, particularly when such orders are infringing on constitutional rights. In other words, a declared state of emergency cannot stand on the mere basis of, on the, of arbitrary Facts, facts matter, facts matter, on arbitrary facts, facts matter. Actual science matters. Reasons why emergency, reasons why an emergency is declared matter. People can't be locked down and restrained from earning a living and having contact with other humans simply because a state authority decides to issue such orders. Your leaders are required now, your honesty and integrity. It is your legal responsibility to end COVID local emergency immediately. The second one is from Amanda Gambin. The United Way of the Santa Cruz County would like to invite you to the Youth Violence Prevention Network, youth-led virtual relaunch event, reimagining a resilient Santa Cruz County Equity and Youth Leadership Summit on September 30th, 2020 from 10 o'clock to 2.15 via YouTube Live, via YouTube Live since 2013. 2012 Youth Violence Prevention Network and our allies have 
held inclusion, equality, equity, and racial justice at the center of all our work. We strive towards a more equitable and united county where young people have the opportunity to succeed in it and are engaged in family, school, and their community. We do this by creating connections between community members and system leaders, building the capacity of the network members to better meet the needs of youth and families, and sharing resources with the community. Traditionally, we have worked with system with system leaders like you to better meet the needs of for youth and families in our community. As we look into the next phase of work, we are excited to continue our system level and racial equality work with youth at our table. We are committed to listening, amplifying, and including youth voices in the decision-making process as we believe this will create a brighter, safer, and more equitable community for all. Some goals this event will accomplish, share the highlight and milestones of Project Thrive and the YVPN to create a shared commitment for centering youth violence and leadership increase, the sense of importance for creating equitable, cultural, responsive, trauma-informed system, increase the understanding as why better meetings, than, why better meeting the needs of youth of color increase while being for all in Santa Cruz County, inspired commitment to individual and collective actions unveil the next phase of the YVPN. We hope you as leaders in our community will join this event to help us continue important work for youth across Santa Cruz. <clears throat> and one last one, and punctuation matters. Um, <laughs> 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 this is from Gail McNulty. Dear supervisors, as a mother who is deeply concerned about the future and more and more even and here and now we are creating for our children, I recognize that you are leading during the most challenging time our world, county, state, and country have ever faced. Today's actions have potential to protect or further doom our region and ultimately all of humanity. Our only hope is to focus on creative, nimble, out-of-the-box solutions that put people, animals, and the planet ahead of profit economic growth. Thank you to Supervisor Coonerty for making Suicide Awareness Month in our county and to Gail for speaking from her heart about her experience with suicide and the importance of removing the stigma and raising awareness about the challenging topic. Bringing this up today at a time when people are of all ages in our county are likely experiencing an overwhelming sense of hopelessness <laughs> is particularly important. Last Wednesday's orange skies had many talking about the apocalypse. As Governor Newsom and many firefighters have pointed out in regard to the intense lightning storms, escalating wildfires, we are facing a fast forward of climate crisis. Although this board has declared a climate emergency, some of our community still believes the dangerous misconception that climate crisis is not real. As you know, the climate crisis is a political myth. It's scary reality playing out in real time and getting worse every day getting worse every day as our governments move slowly to or continue full speed ahead in the wrong direction. Despite Governor Newsom's str strong acknowledgement of how the climate crisis is devastating our state, he has yet to address the fact that California continues to profit on fossil fuels, fracking, unsustainable and harmful industrial agricultural practice, unfair and unsafe treatments of farm workers and more. As we begin the post-fire rebuilding process, while trying to figure out the safest way forward in the pandemic and working to support those in our community, we have and will lose jobs and businesses as a result of an economic crisis. Our county has the opportunity to set a precedent for how to create a compassionate, just, sustainable, and resilient community. We are more vulnerable now than we have ever been before. Please keep in mind that some of us have lost homes in the fires. Many have already lost their jobs. Everyone is experiencing extreme stress. Prior to all of this, our county w was already unaffordable for many. We absolutely must protect the right to affordable housing as part of the rebuilding process. While permitting is important to ensure safety building, safe building practices, especially now that the fires, landslides, water issues, extreme heat, lightning, high winds, and more will get worse as the climate crisis continues. We must protect the right of low and middle income people and those who are currently unemployed. Let's not, let's not let the current crisis further escalate homelessness and inequity through our county. Um, hold one second as some have been coming in. 
And that is it for public comment. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. It takes uh, uh, action on the consent agenda. Uh, do any board members have comments or additional direction for items? Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. There's just a couple uh, items I'd like to comment on. Uh, on item number uh, 24, uh, about the termination of the exclusive negotiation agreement with Green Valley Corporation for the 7th and Bromer site. I look forward uh, to us uh, working uh, with this site, especially in the creation of housing. And I, uh, I, I think this is the next step that we need to take in order to get to that place. Uh, I'm appreciative of the work the staff put into it. On item number 27, uh, I'm, uh, this is an item to direct Public Works uh, to issue encroachment permits for nominated slow streets programs in the, in the county. I wanna thank Bike Santa Cruz County for their work uh, in helping make this happen. And I look forward to uh, ways to support neighborhoods so they can slow the traffic in their streets and make it safer for them as they, as they and their families uh, recreate outside. On item number uh, 32, I wanna uh, thank the, uh, the all involved, including the probation office about this Prop 47 grant. Um, these, uh, this grant will provide really great uh, services uh, here in our community. And it's a great example of how Prop 47 is delivering results uh, for us in the community. And I think that's it. Uh, Supervisor uh, Friend. Thank you, Chair. I have nothing to add uh, regarding consent. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Thank you, Chair. I have nothing to add either. More dereliction. And Supervisor McPherson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. A couple items. Uh, item number 25 on the uh, coronavirus relief funds. Uh, I thank the, the staff for the update. Uh, I appreciate the information on the categories we are funding, uh, but I would like to get um, more specifics on the actual funding allocations. And uh, they don't have to answer it now, but I uh, would love to uh, have a report back on some more specifics on the funding allocations of our coronavirus relief funds. Uh, if I could give that direction to the CAO's office or whoever, I would appreciate that. Um, on item number 46, um, I am pleased to see, that's the Boulder Creek Library. I am pleased to see us award this contract. It'll be more important now than ever uh, to have a renovated library in uh, Boulder Creek, which has been hit hard by the lightning fires, that whole San Rosa Valley region. Uh, the community will need a nice place to visit, read and study in the near future, we hope. Uh, originally, we only had about a half million dollars to put toward Boulder Creek, but when our Measure S funds that voters approved uh, turned out to be healthier than projected, we assigned more to Boulder Creek and it made it an even better project. Uh, I want to thank the voters for approving Measure S. Uh, I also want to congratulate the friends of the Boulder Creek Library for uh, their efforts to raise additional funds. We have uh, Seeing time and again the impact of community investment, and this is going to uh, pay off huge dividends uh, for the uh, Boulder Creek community. And lastly, um, although it's not part of the consent agenda, I just wanted to, uh, to recognize and offer a special thank you to our parks team for the improvements at Highlands Park and Ben Lohman uh, on the Wi Fi and addressing some of the irrigation issues at uh, Highlands Park, a very popular park in the San Lorenzo Valley. Um, and even though all of our departments are pitching in on COVID and fire response, uh, this is a reminder that other needs still exist and we are addressing them. And I just wanna thank a, a big, give a big thank you to our parks department for addressing some needs that we have in our existing facilities. Highlands Park is a tremendous uh, facility for the whole San Lorenzo Valley and the senior community in particular. So just thank you for everything that you're doing uh, as, as we go along with all these crises we are facing. It's much appreciated. So thank you to the Parks Department. Thank you. 
And uh, I have nothing to pull, uh, so we'll go to, uh, we'll do a, a roll call. Uh, well, I would move the consent agenda. Uh, I think there was additional direction by uh, Supervisor McPherson. Uh, so yes. I, would, I would move it as amended. Thank you. And he's second. second. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Friend? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Chair Caput? Aye. Uh, motion passes unanimously. And that takes us now to the regular agenda, starting with item number seven. How you doing? Good morning. <laughs> uh, consider resolution amending the general plan, local coastal program, uh, public safety element and conservation and open space element, accepting CEQA negative declaration Consider approval and concept of four ordinances in amending Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 16.10, Geologic Hazards 16.13, Floodplain Regulations, New 16.20, Grading Regulations, and 16.22, Erosion Control to retune. Uh, for a second re uh, reading and final adoption on October 6, 2020 and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the planning director. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, David Carlson with the planning department. Um, at the conclusion of the March 10th uh, public hearing on this project, the Board of uh, Supervisors directed the planning department to make several uh, modifications to the proposed amendments, uh, which we're presenting today. Um, except first, I wanted to just go over a, a brief recap of the overall project. Um, the project would amend the safety element of the general plan and the local coastal plan and related county codes. Uh, provisions of state law require that the county update the safety element to address flood hazards, fire hazards, climate change, and sea level rise. And the Coastal Commission has published a guidance document to assist uh, local jurisdictions to plan for sea level rise. Uh, public interest in this project has focused on the amendments to the existing policies in the safety element for building on coastal bluffs and beaches. That's section 6.4 of the safety element. The overall approach both now and with the uh, amendments for projects at beach level, including Pajaro Dunes, is that the coastal storm wave hazard is mitigated by constructing elevated homes in compliance with FEMA regulations. For projects on eroding coastal bluffs, the primary mitigation for coastal erosion hazards is the geologic setback from the edge of the coastal bluff. And armoring, shoreline armoring is also a significant issue in both situations. The Coastal Commission guidance for local communities recommends a managed retreat approach which would severely restrict development on many coastal properties compared to the county's existing policies and regulations. County staff has recommended a hybrid approach that does adopt many of the Coastal Commission's recommendations, but stops short of the full managed retreat approach and provides more flexibility on bluff setback requirements and shoreline armoring requirements, depending on the location of the project. The proposed amendments would apply different policy approaches depending on the geographic context. In area one between Soquel Point and the Capitola city limits, um, the proposed amendments would, uh, would establish a shoreline protection exception area where shoreline armoring would be allowed throughout the area. This is an area of tall cliffs and little to no beach area and it's generally accessible only during low tides. If you're on the team's call, please make sure you're muted. Thank you. In area two between the harbor and Soquel Point and South County urbanized areas, the amendments would preserve the existing general approach regarding armoring. New armoring may be allowed depending on the circumstances and existing armoring could be considered in geologic setback calculations. The creation of shoreline management plans would be encouraged in these areas. areas Three covers beach level development and would limit the elevated height of a structure on the beach and limit the construction of seawalls on the beach. 
Area four is all of the rural areas of the county coastline where very little development exists and a managed retreat approach is proposed. This means new structures and major remodels of existing structures would have to be set back an adequate distance from a coastal bluff without reliance on any existing or proposed shoreline armoring and no shoreline armoring would be, no new shoreline armoring would be allowed. Um, other key components of this new hybrid approach include a requirement to reevaluate existing shoreline armoring as part of a construction of a new house or reconstruction or re major remodel of an existing house, requirements to repair and maintain existing armoring, a mitigation fee program for existing or new shoreline armoring, and expanded language on required deed recordations. <clears throat> and there's also provisions for setback exceptions uh, that would be added. So there are two attachments in your packet, J and K, which show the changes to the public safety elements, section 6.4 and the related county code chapter 1610 in response to the board's direction on March 10th. Most of the changes add or clarify existing policy language and don't really change the intent of the policy uh, amendments. However, the direction to provide more flexibility in policy 6.4.11 does represent an important change. This is the proposed policy that addresses greater than 50% projects in the urban area, but outside of the shoreline protection exception area. This would be the uh, area two that I uh, described before. The previous policy language would have restricted, set, restricted such projects to one time only after this update. The updated policy language would provide more flexibility. There would be no geologic review for smaller projects involving less than 50% of the existing house there would be no limit on the number of smaller projects that could occur in the future. The geologic setback requirement for the first greater than 50% project after this update would be essentially the same as it is now, which allows consideration of existing shoreline armoring in the calculation of the setback. However, for a second greater than 50% project, the calculation of the setback would not consider existing armory, and this is the managed retreat approach. Uh, the policy includes provisions for setback exceptions and would also be reevaluated in 2040. Uh, the proposed amendments would not become effective until certified by the California Coastal Commission. Uh, the Coastal Commission can and often does modify proposed LCP amendments proposed by local jurisdictions. And if modified, the Board of Supervisors is given the opportunity to either accept or reject those modifications. Our recommendation is that the Board of Supervisors consider the proposed amendments to this public safety element and the conservation and open space element of the general plan, local coastal plan, the proposed amendments to chapter 1610, 1620, and 1622 of the Santa Cruz County Code and the proposed addition of chapter 1613 to the Santa Cruz County Code. Um, adopt the attached resolution, adopting the sequent negative declaration and updating and amending the general plan and local coastal plan safety element and conservation open space element and directing staff to submit the local coastal program amendments to the California Coastal Commission for certification and to file the sequent negative declaration with the clerk of the board. Approve in concept the uh, attached implementation ordinances, amending the county code and local coastal program as related to chapter 1610, chapter 1613, chapter 1620, and chapter 1622, and schedule the ordinances for second reading and final adoption on October 6th, 2020, and direct staff to implement the amendments outside of the coastal zone 30 days after adoption and within the coastal zone upon, upon final certification by the Coastal Commission. That concludes my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Carlson. I, I don't really have a lot of questions at this point because I'm interested in hearing the public testimony, although I did want to acknowledge your work on this because it's basically uh, a borderline impossible task of trying to uh, strike a balance between two potentially irreconcilable positions between uh, the desires of many within the coastal zone and coastal homeowners and uh, the desires of the Coastal Commission and the interpretation of the Coastal Act. So I appreciated the fact that you've been willing to meet with constituents, hold community meetings and discussions, 
and continue to work on a document that tries to strike a balance. Um, I just, uh, I recognize that that's been a very tall task. And, and again, I'm, I'm interested in hearing some of the community comments so we can move toward uh, some sort of resolution on this, but I just wanted to acknowledge your work. Thank you, Supervisor. Yeah, uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Thank you, Supervisor. Chair, I don't have any questions. I look forward to hearing from the community. Uh, Supervisor McPherson. Uh, I want to hear the public testimony, but I, I second the uh, the comments by Supervisor Friend. I think this has been a, a really a challenging, a long time process, and I really commend David Carlson and the planning staff uh, getting together with the property owners to try to get to a uh, an agreement that everybody can, uh, or an agreement that everybody can say yes to, but um, that's gonna be difficult to do, but uh, thank you everyone for your efforts. But I'd like to hear the public comment before I uh, have uh, any more comments of my own. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, no additional questions. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, uh, the Coastal Commission has a lot to say on everything we've been trying to do here, right? Yes. Okay. And we kind of have an understanding of uh, how far we can go and how far we can't go? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Right, okay. And uh, that picture uh, <clears throat> on the last uh, frame, uh, there were three pictures at the bottom. Mm -hmm. The picture on the far right, any idea where that was? Far right, that was bottom, uh, Beach uh, Drive. The last uh, Beach uh, Beach Drive. Uh, can we go back to that? Yeah, the far right mm -hmm. <laughs> bottom. I kind of recognize the others, but uh, this one looks really bad. Mm -hmm. The middle one is uh, Rio Del Mar, and the uh, one on the left is Sea sure. Any sea idea where area. it was taken, the picture? I believe, I believe that was 1982, which is yeah. when we experienced a large amount okay. of coastal damage. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll open it up to the public. Uh, if you'd like to speak on this uh, topic, uh, how many do we have that are gonna speak on this topic? Three. Okay, all right, we'll give you three minutes, come on. Somebody ready? Uh. Good morning, I'm Matt, the co-Britain, Matt Britain Architects, president of the Pacific Coast uh, Protection Association. Um, Here's an article, Cal Matters, dated April 28, 2020. Not a right wing uh, organization at all. And it states, back off the beach in the rising sea. No way, California cities say. The vast majority of California cities are saying no to this. We're one natural disaster in Southern California away from all of this just being taken away. And it's ironic today where we're discussing natural disaster from fire due to climate change and discussing flooding due to climate change. And in one instance, we're going, how do we get these people in their homes? How do we get them to protect their homes? How do we address this? And on the other hand, we're saying, we're gonna make this much harder for you. The county see it, um, retired geologist said, it's gonna be much harder. All the professionals will say, it's making it much harder. So this is a very big disconnect. And again, this is important where the board needs to meet with professionals and have unfiltered conversations about what these things mean. Uh, Mr. Carlson has done a tremendous amount of work. I'm, he's, I'm certain a good person but this is an ill-advised approach. And it, it, Mr. Carlson at one of the community meetings, one of the difficulties here too is I get three minutes. 
Every time I've gone to this, staff gets to talk and talk and talk, but the public doesn't get much. So anyway, this meeting, I was talking about Beach Drive, Las Olas, Pot Belly Beach, yada, yada. And so, yeah, you raise the houses up <coughs> as FEMA requires. But the problem is, is it's seawalls that protect access to those homes. And according to Mr. Carlson, he said, well, we're not going to let you rebuild the, the roads, and then those houses will be a nuisance, and you'll have to abandon them. And at these houses, I know, county environmental planning considered, at least with the past geologic, the county geologist, were considered the houses in those seawalls to protect the toe of the bluff of the homes above. And I actually got a project approved recently where it says right in the conditions of approval, you won't be able to protect this home in the future. So I'm like, going, now wait a second. <laughs> Do you all know that? Do you think the people there understand that? Okay, and then I have a project in Opal Cliff where supposedly it's in the exception zone. But the condition of approval was they'd have to get together with other people to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Becky. Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of rural Aptos. Um, I have looked through out in the convenience copy of all of these code changes. I see changes that address geologic, riparian, watershed, erosion, grading, shoreline, flood, seismic, hazard mitigation, nothing about fire risk management. Am I missing it? Can you please help me clarify that? If I've missed it, please let me know where it is. But I didn't see it out there. And it's, it's odd that we're not talking about it if, if it is missing. Um, I want to uh, point out that what I did see in uh, section 6.11.1 through 6.11.4 addresses electric and magnetic fields. And I applaud that the county is trying to address this problem. People have been before you many times trying to get uh, uh, you to take jurisdiction and sometimes you have ruling against the people of the community who do not want cell towers in their backyards. 6.11.2 would require measurement of ambient magnetic fields for all residential land divisions and other new discretionary development. You need to enforce that because it's not happening right now. And the, the um, carriers are not required to even measure anything after the towers are installed to uh, make a case for cumulative damage with the uh, possibility of 5G coming. We have got to hop on this and really stand up and enforce it for the, the health and safety and the well-being of the people. I really applaud the County Public Works for using the um, PG&E set aside money, $17 million to address underground grounding power lines um, to address not aesthetics this time, but rather public safety in the rural areas where fire danger is a real problem. That needs to continue. And you need to require all underground, uh, all new development to have underground. Um, Chapter 6.12.4 would require all new development in the San Lorenzo Valley to have alternative septic systems. Is that going to be a requirement for those people who have lost their homes to rebuild? If so, those are incredibly expensive and we must provide um, financial assistance. I recognize that um, some systems are compromised, but if we're going to make that a requirement to rebuild, you can't put that on the backs of the property owners or they will not be able to rebuild. It's very expensive. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Charlie E.D., E.D. Consultants. I'm working with Pajaro Dunes, the two neighborhood homeowner associations, north and south. I just wanted to uh, echo what's been said of 
in words of appreciation for the staff, the work on that they've done with this. We've had a number of meetings and follow up correspondence and you know, we're, we're beginning to think we understand it, but it is a rather complex set of uh, policies. Um, our letter today says two things. It was written by Jeff Ramundo, who's the president of the Coastal Development Regulations Study Group, which is a subcommittee of the homeowners. And uh, two things, one is we understand that there's some various, you know, cleanup issues uh, in terms of language and so forth that have been um, identified. And our group concurs that uh, it might be prudent to delay this again one more time just to address some of those. Uh, secondly, if you go ahead and approve it or if you delay it, we would request that you take the language that we have proposed starting at the end of page two in our letter and add that in as part of your resolution with direction to staff to uh, start with that and refine it. We had some correspondence with uh, Mr. Carlson yesterday and I spoke with him this morning and he said that they'd be happy to tweak the language that we put out there uh, to uh, if he's so directed by your board. The reason we want that is because there's so much uh, uh, hunting and pecking to find things through the ordinance. We just wanted to establish a kind of a clear section that says, here's how these things apply to Pajaro Dunes, because there are a lot of differences between what Pajaro Dunes faces and what the other uh, areas are dealing with. So in the guiding principles, you do have a lot of um, explanatory language and we thought that would be a good place to put that in. So our request would be that you direct staff to uh, refine the language which we put out there knowing that it wasn't gonna be quite right and include that in your final action. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. How you doing? Uh, Good morning. Uh, T. John Connors, uh, homeowner here. I, I just wanna start off by saying that um, I, I don't think you guys should go for this plan. Um, it's very complicated and it makes it more uh, difficult for every homeowner to be able to protect their, their property. And I think the values of these homes are gonna go down. So I did attend a meeting at the at beginning uh, first quarter of this uh, year. I can't remember which one, I think it was the March or February. What I noticed about the meetings, which was uh, interesting, is that everybody that came up to the podium uh, for these uh, planning meetings, they want a little carve out for their special lot. Please help me with my lot and I'm, I'm okay. What I, what I fear is that after we're all gone and this thing is put into place, you're gonna have little carve outs for people and there's not gonna be a, uh, uh, an overall plan that you can, you, can, you can look at that is fair for everybody. So you're gonna go be creating whoever's in charge of these uh, approval of plans and the development, you're creating somebody that is a very powerful person within the county to make exceptions for this lot, an exception for this neighborhood. As he, this last gentleman says, his is very special. They want something for his specific plan. That that's creates a, a, a huge problem for fairness overall. That's the first thing. Now, if I have more time, I'd, I'd like to share a story with you. This is impacting people. It's not rich guys that are, that are having all these properties on the uh, coast, okay? We have people, seniors. I talked to two couples. They're, as you know, most people are trying to have, um, their house is their, the, the main asset that they have. Their plan, they're in their late 70s, their plan is to eventually sell their house and then move into a, a, a nice assisted living. Now their plan is when this passes, they won't be able to sell it for the price that they can and they're, and they're gonna go on Medi-Cal. I mean, th this, this thing is, is, is changing every aspect of our community, top to bottom. 
you, you guys think you're affecting some, some uh, rich people on Pleasure Point. That's not that. You guys are really impacting all our seniors. These are the people that if you go up and down the street, the, the owners of the, these, these houses, their hairs are all gray. They're, they're, they're 70s plus. What's, what's gonna happen to these people? I, I think you guys really need to think about it and do some more community and talk. D don't vote for this, please. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. Good morning. My name is Michael Dobrin. I do live in the zone. There are implications uh, within these extended sessions that I feel will harm the county in the long run. Let's talk about taxes, tax base for house. If these houses are confiscated or obliterated without recompensation, the tax base is gone. That's one element. Secondarily, we all know that Santa Cruz thrives on tourism. A number of these houses in this region are rental houses. I know my wife and I pay rental permits to rent our house. The rental permits disappear along with a rental base, thereby harming businesses restaurants when they open, grocery stores, you name it. This is a convoluted and very, very complicated procedure, I understand. But this rush to just slam this through, I know it's complex, I know the issues, but it's not well thought out for the economic health of Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone, uh, anyone downstairs? We had one gentleman that wanted to speak downstairs, but I think he's coming up here. So in the meantime, I have some web comments that we can read. And I'm gonna set the timer. The first web comment comes from Steve Forer. My name is Steve Forer and I am president of Coastal Property Owners Association of Santa Cruz County with over 540 <coughs> members, including 12 homeowners associations representing over 1,000 coastal parcels. CPOA urges the Board of Supervisors to delay the vote on proposed amendments to Santa Cruz County Local Coastal Program relating to coastal bluffs and beaches, land use plan section 6.4, and geological haz hazards implementation Plan Chapter 1610. Although the planning department responded to John Leopold's motion on M March 10th, 2020, there are still many flaws and inconsistencies in the document which could lead to misunderstanding and potential lawsuits against the county. These documents are not ready to be submitted to the California Coastal Commission for review and certification. We have worked with the we have worked with the county in good faith and have provided thoughtful and reasonable input on change which are needed to clarify the documents. We asked the attorney, Derek Oliver, for additional legal review of the red line changes since March 10th to the local coastal program relating to coastal bluffs and beaches, land use plan section 6.4, and geological hazards implementation plan chapter 16.10, which were provided with the Board of Supervisors agenda packet for today's meeting. The attached documents Annotated by Derek Oliver provides detailed comments regarding the internal inconsistencies, ambiguities, and apparent potential limitations which exceed those required by the Coastal Act. If the Board of Supervisors chooses not to delay the vote on proposed amendments, the Santa Cruz County Local Coastal Program relating to coastal bluffs and beaches and geological hazards, we ask for the following amendments to be made. One replace or repaired structures due to damage by coastal process shall be approved if they meet LUP policies 6.4.11 and 
12.2, the first major redevelopment replacement project shall be approved, will be allowed to take into consideration any existing shoreline protection, and will not be required to have a geological hazard assessment. Three property owners with currently less than a 25 foot bluff setback shall be given permission to proceed with a vertical seawall or repair existing seawalls consistent with the planned uniform seawall within the SPEA four. Uh, within the SPEA, f number four, the term of condition for pre-existing permits for shoreline armoring shall not be altered. The requirements for geological hazard assessment and new monitoring maintenance and repair plan should not be applied to pre-existing permits prior to the adoption of the, pros of the proposed LCP and code amendments. Number five, there shall be no new limitations on The next comment we have is Ali Webster <coughs> commenting on behalf of the Surfrider Foundation Santa Cruz. I hope you have all had time to read over the comments and suggestions sent to you by the Coastal Commission staff. We would like to express our agreement with the Commission's suggestions and encourage continued work on the LCP amendments. I must echo our concerns for the past year that private landowners have been the primary stakeholder heard in the process of developing these LCP amendments and that it shows through quite clearly in the language of the document. The vocal minority of property owners has put very one-sided pressure on the planning department to recognize the needs of these property owners. Needs which may seem more tangible and urgent in, the mo in this moment than the long-term rights of the community as a whole and the protection of our sandy beaches. I urge you more strongly consider the future of our beaches and the tens of thousands community members who do not own coastal property. People ha who have an equal right to the beaches for both recreation and economic stability. We encourage the county to narrow the exception area, which defines some of our most valuable coastal area as urban, posing great risk to those beaches. We would also like to see the one-time rebuild considered as it ensures the property owners who will go overboard with both remodels and armoring work in order to maximize their one chance. If we are going to allow our coastlines to change by the, as they need to, we must start now. As the county's amendments will be sent to the Coastal Commission staff for review, I hope that in the light of their com comments and suggestions, you will choose to continue revising the LCP and send only the most thoughtful and formed document <coughs> possible. Please remember that 90% of bluff top homes in Santa Cruz County are second homes and vacation rentals. Please remember that these beaches belong to everyone and that the cost of continued shoreline armoring should not fall on the shoulders of the general public. Thank you for your time. And I have two more, but if you want to take the comments for the people here, we could do that. Almost good afternoon. Um, I moved to this county in 94 and lived in a rural area, Oak Ridge Road from 94 to 2014. Um, it's my understanding that at that time, let's say 20 years ago, the County of Santa Cruz had the largest building department in the state, even though it's the smallest physical county. I think it's only 420 square miles. My point is I've probably had 150 inspections in this county since then and having a relationship with, you know, there are only 13 houses on Oak Ridge Road. Um, some places were chicken coops. One building, you know, the owner said that he admittedly had over 900 cement trucks to complete his house. Uh, my point is, I looked at the over 900 page binder yesterday for as much time as I could. I spent a little bit of time here, but are these regulations actually making it easier for the homeowners to actually do business and thrive? Are they actually making it easier? That's it, thank you for your time. Good morning, hello again. My name is Claire Machado. I'm building designer, uh, consultant, real estate licensed, and a design professional co-compliance person for over 30 years. Uh, prior to his death last year on October 1st, after being taken from his home and murdered, Mr. Tushar Atre lived at 3034 Pleasure Point Drive. I was working for Mr. Atre. He had hired me to take a look at adding a second story 
to a structure. In doing so, I researched the history of the property and found that there was actually an emergency coastal permit that was issued to armor the bank of that house 20 years ago. A permit that was never followed up or inspected. There were recommendations at the time to do a simple shot treat on that property. That property is one of the few and probably only properties <laughs> with a stairway down the back directly to the beach. It's actually next to a very nice home designed by Mr. Cove Britton and company. These are very difficult issues when we bring these up and we go back to the county and say, hey, this was an emergency permit 20 years ago. It's still standing, but nobody did anything. So what do we do about it today? Is it an emergency today? Is it not an emergency today? What is it? And right now the property's in probate. So what the hell, excuse me, what's gonna happen <laughs> when there's no ability to address these new codes? There's no real true understanding about what it is going to affect and cost in the future to these residents to try to maintain these beautiful existing properties, let alone try to do redesign, reconstruction, rearmament to whatever standard we need to, to please the state, to please coastal, to please you, and to try to do it in a manner that's financially possible for an owner. So please, I recommend we do what Cove was asking. Meet with your design professionals on a one-on-one -on -one open meeting basis, your geologists, your engineers, your civil engineers, they're, they're design professionals in this community that have such a knowledge base to help you, help them. Please, I urge you, do not pass this today. Thank you. Well, that concludes uh, public comment uh, on the no, other. No, couple, I'm sorry. Couple other comments. I'm sorry, Chair. That we still have some web comments. I'll bring it back to the board. Uh, no, no, there's a couple more comments. Sure, oh, there is. I'm yes, sorry. thank you. Uh, okay, this one is from Mark Masara. I am an attorney and work with California Coastal Property Owners Nonprofit and local governments on the coastal protection issues. I support the LCP amendment and urge you to approve it. I want to commend your staff for their work and property with property owners and the board, broader community to devise a progressive strategy suitable for the unique Santa Cruz Monterey Bay area that allows property owners to continue to construct and repair seawalls and clarifies their right to remodel and redevelopment their and redevelopment their properties while ensuring significant new and permanent public benefits associated with those projects. Make no mistake, this is not ideal. It does not include unlimited rights for property owners, nor does it go as far as CCC would like it removing coastal bluff development. However, if approved, it will be the most progressive LCP in California. Go no further than Half Moon Bay up coast to see how dramatically adverse new LCPs can be to property owners as they consider policies much worse than how Santa Cruz, much worse than Santa Cruz right now. Or the seawall wars in San Diego that pit property owners against the community in the light of Santa Cruz is in that light, Santa Cruz is a breath of fresh air and, comp comp and compromise that will allow projects to move forward with very significant privately funded public benefit. Something that our community and future residents can enjoy for decades to come without cost to taxpayers. Imagine publicly usable seawalls with walkways and public stairs that would allow anyone and not just surfers to enjoy shoreline pedestrian access along Pleasure Point Drive and Opal Cliffs. 
It is a first step. If it works, programs can be extended beyond the exception area. Regarding the request for delay, I oppose further delay. Staff has worked for the, on this for years. Our focus now should be working with coastal staff and the coastal commission members to obtain their support for our initiatives. Further delay won't help us as this needs to be considered and approved by the coastal commission to help land landowners and the community now. Last thought, remember that the, if the CCC rewrites the LCP or pulls the rug out from under the county as has occurred with respect to our community's efforts to update the LCPs, Santa Cruz County is free to object, disregard and deny the CCC modification and simply walk away from the LCP if it is modified in any way that this board objects to in the future. In that case, you would be left with the same LCP you have now. Certainly not ideal, but no worse off. With that in mind, let's give it our best shot at improving the LCP. If we succeed, we will dramatically improve standing of both property owners and visitors. Okay. The next one is from Gail McNulty. I am concerned that wildfire components of the proposed amendments are based on the 2009 Lockheed fire <coughs> and a wildlife assessment that seems to be predate the current one, which has already raised many locations in the county to severe wildfire threat. Please consider tabling this amendment and updating it based on the current wildfire or committing to revisit the climate crisis threat once we better understand the extent of damage incurred in recent fires, additionally extreme weather and erosion events that may occur. The next one. <coughs> Hello, I am a retired sign language interpreter <coughs> from Last Chance Road. I worked for the state of California for 21 years and was looking forward to my retirement in the woods. My husband and I would very much like to rebuild. We appreciate all of the messages, signals we have seen from county officials expressing the desire to streamline the rebuilding process, including provisions for previously unpermitted homes. The sentiments are much appreciated. In order to achieve the goals of maintaining adequate housing stock in Santa Cruz County, getting local, local residents back in their homes and recognizing the dire circumstances being faced by rural members of Santa Cruz County, several provisions should be considered. We need a permitting process that is alternative. I, I think that's for the next item. It's, it is, and I was directed that I need to read them as they come in. Okay. <laughs> but if you would like, I can move on. I want the person to be heard. I just thought it would be better okay. on the, in the item that they yeah. should be heard on. And then that would be it. Okay. So we're ready. You're I'll ready to take to it back board. to the board. Uh, any comments? Uh, uh, chair, and... is, is there any more? Apologize. One just came in. Right, My name is Robin Bolster Grant, local land use attorney and former planning department employee. I absolutely respect the amount of time, staff and resources devoted to this effort. My concern continues to be the limit of outreach and notice that have been provided to all property owners whose property rights will be substantially impacted by these changes. There are still many property owners that have no clear understanding of how these changes will impact their ability to use, repair, <clears throat> sell, refinance the or refinance their property. The county has a duty to ensure that all members of the community are well informed about the implications of the amendments in order to give them a voice in this process. Thank you for your time. That is it. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, let's go with, uh, yeah, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the testimony today and thank you for the work on the staff uh, on this item. You know, uh, since April, I've been meeting regularly uh, as a representative of the CSAC Coastal Counties uh, group, uh, as a group with CSAC and the League of California Cities with the Coastal Commission staff and commissioners to look at what uh, could be responses to the need to update LCPs uh, with regard to sea level rise. As people know, the guidance from the commission seemed to be focused on one strategy, which was managed retreat. And that may work in, s in some areas, but it, it did not take into uh, consideration um, lots of voter approved land use policies, uh, many uh, impacts on critical infrastructure. And so this group has been, um, it actually started meeting in July of uh, 2019, but uh, in April we started meeting uh, almost every other week, uh, at, at least twice a month. 
to try to to try to look at innovative strategies that might be able to uh, be models uh, for communities up and down the California coastline. Um, in my conversations with the Coastal Commission staff, the League of California Cities, and the California State Association of Counties, I am convinced that the policies we have before us are the most far-reaching plans um, in the state. Uh, they balance the interest of property owners, uh, the community, and the environment, uh, and they try to look at the actual circumstances of the geology of our coastline, uh, and identify strategies that respond to local conditions. This plan, these policies accepts the science of climate change and works to create a plan of action that we can address the issue in our community. The news that we heard this week about the crumbling ice shelves suggests that preparing for sea level rise is not just an exercise, but it's a requirement we need to be prepared. Our county has been debating these policies for nearly two years. There have been numerous public hearings at the Board of Supervisors and the Planning Commission. There have been community meetings. There have been stakeholder meetings. Um, there have been letters uh, uh, shot around by lawyers uh, and letters from nonprofit organizations. We've received those and we have modified um, these policies as part of that dialogue. I've appreciated that dialogue and I think that they have improved the policies. These policies uh, support, in my opinion, good coastal access, even as the ocean rises and the beaches uh, get smaller and disappear. Items like shoreline management plans provide us new opportunities to create incentives to increase the sandy beach area that we have right now. It allows, this, these policies allows a section of coastline to be designated as a shoreline protection exception area that would allow the maintenance of seawalls and encourage the creation of an assessment district to help neighbors work together on shoreline structures that increase coastal access. There's a lot in these policies. And I understand the, the, that we could all find parts of it that we would change, that we would modify, that we would like language for our particular neighborhood or organization. But we're out here in front. We are on the vanguard in the state of trying to create a set of, uh, of policies that actually reflect the needs of our community. And I think uh, after this nearly two year process, it's time for us to get m more input from coastal staff uh, uh, to find out if we're moving in the right direction. I will be continuing to work with the CSAC League of Cities Group and the Coastal Commission, and we may be in front of the Coastal Commission to talk about the, these concepts in general, not the specifics of the language. Um, I know that, that the, uh, the commission is interested in looking at these strategies and in the presentation of the elements of, of this plan to coastal staff and commissioners to date, we've gotten a good response. So I'm prepared to move these policies and the recommended actions uh, today and look forward to the information we receive from coastal staff. Um, and I encourage the support of my colleagues. Okay, are there any other comments from board members? I'll second. Okay, so we we have a vote second, uh, but any yeah. other comments? Yeah, Chair, I'll, I'll briefly speak to uh, this. This is Supervisor Friend again. Um, I, I agree with with all that Supervisor Leopold just said, and I and I as I had started the conversation uh, in regards to the work of Mr. Carlson. You know, the county has been trying to strike this balance uh, between these legitimate issues of sea level rise and climate change. And also the, the Coastal Commission's request for a full managed retreat and many property owners understandable concerns about what this would mean uh, for them moving forward. And I, I think over the last couple of years, 
we have made a better set of policies than or proposed policies than were initially presented. We also recognize, though, based on the letter we received from the Coastal Commission, that that they don't believe they believe that this uh, goes too far toward the side of the homeowners. The homeowners, based on the comments today and letters we've received, believe that it doesn't go far enough, which to me is actually the definition of balance uh, right there. But it should go to Coastal for more formal comments so that uh, we will have an additional uh, process to continue this discussion. It's clear that Coastal wants to provide formal input uh, that we can continue uh, to work with. And it, it is possible too, and this has been debated across the state as Supervisor Leopold noted, it, it, it's, it's possible that the interests are so disparate of coastal homeowners and coastal property owners that the individual desires may be irreconcilable with what coastal, the Coastal Commission is seeking and what they believe to be consistent with the Coastal Act is across the state. It may be very difficult to create a document that has universal consensus or buy-in. Um, I do think that this is further than a starting point toward that. And I also believe that uh, receiving the coastal feedback will allow us to continue that discussion to see if we can create a model across the state that can be used that I know other communities are gonna be looking for us, to us uh, as a guiding document, which is why I, I support moving this forward today and, and I'm and I'm willing to second this motion. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll make a quick comment. Uh, it's uh, over 400 pages uh, on this topic and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of ramifications in it and I, I looked at it and uh, I, uh, I wanna commend you on doing a good job, but uh, it, would be a, it would be better if somehow we could you know, instead of having 400 something pages to go through, if we could have a more condensed version also, especially for the public uh, to look at. So maybe the 400 something pages and then have a condensed version if somebody wanted to read a short version. We, we did that. That's good. Yeah. Thank the actual you. policies are, are, there's a lot of supporting documentation in those no, 400 I, pages, I mean for the public, but the, uh, the actual policies are, are, are pretty skinny. It, it's kind of like when we have the, when we have the budget, and then we have a shorter version yeah. uh, to read through. Keep up. Yeah, there was a uh, briefing book published yeah, on absolutely. this, along with the initial study and some of the original staff reports. So yes, we did that. And uh, those areas, it's not uh, if something's going to happen, it's when something's going to happen, especially with uh, 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 king tides and also uh, storms and everything else. So, okay, thank you. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is Supervisor McPherson. I just want to make some comments, if I could, please. Um, I just want to, am I on okay? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay, thank you. I, I just wanted to make a couple comments. I, I do agree with uh, Supervisors Leopold and, and Friend about their general comments and the planning staff, Coastal Commission, and the property owners for really getting together uh, and in good faith to advocate for their positions. Uh, I think they've been heard. Uh, I don't know that uh, the ultimate choice or uh, decision is gonna please every, everybody on all sides, but uh, there's some, some differences of opinion, but I really applaud the planning uh, staff under uh, and with uh, David Carlson in particular and the staff for navigating these negotiations between the property owners and our county. And I, I do want to uh, say how much I appreciate as also a, uh, uh, a member of uh, the California State Association of Counties, uh, Mr. Leopold. Uh, we, we are talking about our Santa Cruz County and its impact, but believe me, uh, the California State Association of Counties or CSAC is looking at this as a statewide alternative and some of the proposals from other counties have been rejected by the commission. And so we're trying to, uh, 
I think in the best efforts we can to see how we can make this work so uh, we can come to some agreement on that. Uh, I do support this uh, staff recommendation and moving it forward to the Coastal Commission. Uh, just to be clear though, Mr. Carlson, if th when this goes to the Coastal Commission and they presumably make a decision on what they're going to accept or not accept, uh, will this come back to the county, uh, our county and all the counties along the coast or uh, is the process that the Coastal Commission will make its decision and that's that? Uh, how does that work? Will it be coming back to us again after the Coastal Commission action? If the Coastal Commission makes significant modifications to the what we submit to them, then yes, it comes back to the board for either acceptance or rejection of those modifications. Okay, thank you. Well, I uh, again, I want to applaud all, all sides of this issue. I, I understand it's a very, very emotional one, uh, but I think that we have over the last six months from our March 10th public hearing, uh, have had several sessions with the property owners uh, and uh, the planning staff and uh, the other counties throughout California on the coastline. So I, I, uh, I do approve this recommendation and I thank you again for your hard work in trying to come to a, an, an agreement that uh, most of us can say, well, this is a good proposal moving to the Coastal Commission. So thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor. Yep. Okay, any Mr. other Chair? comments? One more, this is uh, Ryan Coonerty, just a brief comment. Um, so I just, I too wanna add my appreciation to David Carlson and the plan department for the good work. Um, having to do it over again, I'm not sure uh, Santa Cruz County should have placed itself between property owners and the Coastal Commission as we try to uh, map the difficult course uh, of the impacts of climate change as we're seeing across the county. I'm very supportive of moving this forward and getting comments from Coastal Commission um, and I and I also want to say, I mean, this is also a matter of resources. We've been working on this, held multi, many, many hearings, many, many public outreach sessions over the course of two years. We now have 925 people in Santa Cruz County who have lost their homes in fire. We had a housing crisis before this, uh, and we need planning staff to be working on that housing crisis. This is um, of tremendous impact to uh, property owners in the coastal zone. But uh, as was mentioned, these are primarily second homes uh, and we really need to spend our time and energy and effort focusing on the residents of Santa Cruz County. And I'm so in support of moving this forward and then um, and getting the, getting the comments and bringing it back uh, so that we can spend time and energy on the other housing matters that are so pressing to our county right now. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, we have a motion by Supervisor Leopold and a and second, a second by, by Supervisor Friend. Okay. Uh, clerk, uh, please conduct the roll call. Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Chair Caput? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. We will, uh, let's take a short break, 10 minutes, and we'll be right back. And we'll, uh, item number eight is the public hearing. Eight one six zero four, a proposal for permanent room housing at uh, 10110 SoCal Drive in Aptos requiring rezoning and a commercial development permit determined that the proposal is exempt from further environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the planning director. Good morning, uh, yes, still morning. <laughs> okay. Good morning, uh, Daisy Allen, planning department. Uh, thank you, Chair Caput, Supervisors. Uh, the purpose of this public hearing is to consider an application to add the permanent room housing combining district to 10110 Soquel Drive. Um, this property is approximately 0.71 acres located in Aptos near to the junction of Soquel Drive and Freedom Boulevard. The parcel is developed with a restaurant, currently Sid's Smokehouse, and a two-story, 10-room former motel. 
The motel and restaurant were constructed in 1949. The area was uh, called Rod Roy Junction and the hotel itself was called the Rio Del Mar Motel and Cafe and was later changed to the Arabian. Um, nine of the 10 rooms on this property have since been converted to studio apartments over time. The 10th room is used as storage by the restaurant and is not included in the PRH application. Uh, the nine studios range in size from 225 to 260 square feet. Each unit has a full bathroom, refrigerator, hot plate, wall heater, and cabinet space. The units do not have kitchen sinks, but the property owner would be installing kitchen sinks as a condition of approval for the development permit. Units all have at least one dedicated parking space. The site has a general plan designation of CS, service commercial, and is zoned C4. Residential is not a conforming use on service commercial properties, except for in the PRH combining district. There is no permit history recognizing the former motel as a legal non-conforming residential use. Therefore, the residential use on this property has not previously been legalized. There is um, no recent police activity on this property. There is one code enforcement case from 2003, which was resolved when a re-roof permit was obtained. We do look into police records and code enforcement records for PRH applications. Um, the proposed project would legalize the residential use by adding this property to the PRH combining district and would classify the nine units as PRH units. A zoning plan amendment is needed to change the property's zoning to C4 PRH, and a commercial development permit is required to approve and define the parameters of the PRH use. Staff has made the findings for the required approvals. Detailed findings are provided in the resolution and the ordinance in your packet. But to summarize, the project provides a community-related use, which is uh, housing that is affordable by design. The units were originally built as motel rooms, which are not subject to density limits, and the conversion of these rooms to residential units was not anticipated when the motel was first constructed. The site has been in residential use for some time, and as such has low potential to function again in its original use as visitor accommodation. In fact, visitor accommodation is not even an allowed use in the C4 zone district. The rezoning allows for the existing mixed residential and restaurant use of this property to continue and is in the best interests of public health, safety, and welfare. Also, the proposed PRH density is compatible with the general plan and can be accommodated by available utilities and community services. Any intensification of use on this parcel, such as the creation of additional PRH units, would require an amendment to the development permit. Uh, staff has prepared conditions of approval for PRH use on this property. Conditions would include a building inspection, building permits for new kitchen sinks, and also for any other upgrades as needed to meet the health and safety requirements. Conditions also include submittal of rental information and a five-year review. The criteria for the revocation of the permit um, uh, would also be included in the conditions of approval. Uh, staff recommends that the board hold a public hearing and adopt the rezoning ordinance and resolution approving application 181604 and direct staff to file the CEQA notice of exemption with the clerk of the board. Okay. Uh, I'm just looking over the, uh, well, any questions, uh, any questions from board members on this item? Uh, let's go with uh, Supervisor Coonerty. I have none, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Friend. Supervisor Leopold. Friend. Uh, I don't have any questions, but I do have a very honest Supervisor Friend, you might want to repeat your comments because it was very garbled. Okay, yes. so, uh, thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Now, I, I don't have any questions. I do have a brief comment, which is just that we have received some uh, public input in regards to this with, with questions about, uh, or I would say a, a misunderstanding of these as hotels. And I do believe that this was 
briefly covered, but I think that it's it's worth noting out that the properties like this one that we're considering, these aren't currently operating as motels that aren't doing well as a visitor serving accommodation, which is what a lot of the outreach we'd received are. That these are these are hotels or motels that haven't been operating as such in some case in decades uh, that have been serving as an affordable housing option that we're just formalizing as such. And I think it's an important distinction that uh, people be aware of. But thank you. And I have no questions, uh, Chair. Uh, the location, is, it's uh, fairly close uh, <coughs> to Aptos High School, right? Uh, yes, I, I believe so. Yeah. And I, I saw in there, it, it, it <coughs> basically will be converted to one or two persons occupancy uh, per unit. Correct. Uh, is it possible uh, for a family or something to uh, have a larger unit or anything like that? Um, these units are studio units. A maximum is 260 square feet. So it, it wouldn't really be feasible for a, a family. Um, I, I only thought of that because it's close to the high school. And let's say you have a mom and dad and a high school age uh, student. They could walk to the school. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, I will now open up the uh, public hearing on item number eight. Uh, you have three minutes. How many people do we have to speak? I don't see any, but uh, we have one. Hi, Mary Lee Sams Wiley. I have a concern you said the, it was originally built in 1944? Um, 1949. 1949, so current electrical standards, all of that stuff, is that corded electrical wire that's in there, the old fashioned, is it gonna be completely rewired, brought up to current standards? Because when you're adding on all kinds of new electrical and whatever else they've got in there, it's gonna create an overload, overheat, um, I don't know if it has the current electrical boxes or the old, um, those other things that are used to, that are not allowed anymore. So it should be brought up to current code standards, including the covered soffits, the covered everything to make it um, less fire stuff because people do smoke up there. I've seen it and such. And I'm, you know, I wish them well that it's a affordable unit, but it does need to be safe at current code standards since they're now gonna legalize it to switch it over, in my opinion, along with all of the whatever else that needs to be done to bring it up to current healthy standards. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else would like to speak on uh, item number eight? Uh, I see none in here. Any? We, ha we have um, one web comment. And it is from a user called Mercury Miner. Hello, the agenda material provided prior comments, provide prior comments. Thank you for directing staff to create PRH. And thanks to the commission planning and everyone who has worked over the last two years to make the PRH overlay a reality. This will be useful going forward for additional conversions of obsolete multi-occupant short stay facilities, badly needed for affordable by design housing. Sincerely, Michael Cox, Lisner Properties, SoCal, California. That will be it. Okay. Uh... Public hearing is now closed. And I'll bring it back to the board. Any discussion or action? I'll move the recommended actions. Second. We have first by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Leopold. And if we could have a uh, roll call vote. Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Chair Caput? Uh, aye. Uh, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, next, we have item number nine. Uh, consider strategies to support rebuilding after the CSU, CZU lightning complex fire disaster and direct staff to return October 6th 2020 with an updated information 
and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the planning director. Aye. I think you need to. Um, good morning, Chair Caput, members of the board and um, citizens and members from all of the different agencies and departments that are here today to um, be available to you. I'm Kathy Malloy, I'm the planning director. And um, while I'm delivering the presentation, I did wanna emphasize that it reflects the collaboration input and information from a number of divisions in planning, from environmental health, from Department of Public Works, from fire districts, and many others. The agenda for today um, will go through the extent of the damage, the key rebuilding steps, both prior to submitting an application for a building permit and what happens during that process. We all, you, your board on September 1st also gave us certain specific directives in terms of information that you wanted to be made available today um, in a fairly detailed way that the staff report is very detailed and per your request, this presentation will also contain quite a bit of information regarding the opportunities for temporary housing, um, information about the website, the resource recovery center, the streamlining um, activities that we are working on and the opportunity for some reduced permit fees for reconstruction. We're also gonna talk through some of the, the special challenges, the extent of damage, the location, the nature of the, the area um, is indeed going to present some special challenges going forward. So first, the extent of damage. Um, you would ask that that be broken out specifically by supervisorial district, which the damage occurred in district three and district five. There have been a total of about 911 destroyed homes. That number may go up um, somewhat. The, the visual inspections and posting of structures has occurred, but there's refinement um, of the database that's uh, currently ongoing. In addition to the 911 destroyed homes, there was about 500 other types of structures destroyed and about 90 damaged homes. So the key, key rebuilding steps, many of people who have suffered damage have already begun these steps at the Resource Recovery Center online and through other means. There's the filing of the claims with insurance companies, there's registering with FEMA um, to receive assistance and there may be some, some other options. Uh, beginning to gather information um, to prepare for rebuilding steps is, is next. And so filing a calamity application with the assessor that can be done electronically. And that results in uh, the owner being emailed the assessor's data on the, the site itself. <coughs> the planning department also has a records room and there's a special email address that's been set up so that you could electronically request records and archives regarding your property from the planning department. The, uh, the environmental health is in the lead on uh, cleanup activities. Obviously public works and others are also involved. I, I think most people know that phase one is the hazardous materials cleanup and the US EPA is going to be coming in and doing that. That will be at no cost to the owner and we, they need some time to stage and set up, et cetera, but that's expected to begin September 28th. After properties have had the hazardous materials removed, um, those properties, you know, as they get cleaned, they can move on to a phase two cleanup. We don't yet have formal word that Cal Recycle, the state agency, will be carrying out phase two in Santa Cruz County but I think um, we're all sort of hoping and expecting that that will be the case. If so, then that uh, phase two cleanup will also occur at no cost to the private owners. They will, uh, private owners do have the option to uh, go forward privately, but if they do pursue phase two privately, then they will need to be paying fees. Uh, keep going backwards. All right. Um, Again, more pre-application steps in terms of getting ready to rebuild. 
some of the, the areas are going to be more straightforward than others. Um, any site will need to have potable water be hooked up to, to sewer or have a functioning septic system and be connected to PG&E power. And we know that there's a lot of structures that have been not red tagged, that are not yellow tagged, that they're, they're green. And so they can move forward with getting PG&E to hook up their power. And we at the building division may need to get involved in authorizing that through either stickers or communications with PG&E. And that's kind of a stage that we're at right now. If there's need to improve, um, say your septic system, then you will need to work on how to figure that out and get that done uh, before you could submit a building permit application. We're also uh, strongly advising that property owners do what they can to install erosion control and stabilize the site because we are coming up on a rainy season and there's um, all the ash and, and materials that uh, can, can themselves create a hazard in that area. So coordinating with the county geologist, we're trying to put together a, a screening tool to let people know whether they have to worry about that or not in terms of um, geologic hazards and also some of the areas, some of the damage has occurred in areas with roads that are not up to current standards. And so the fire district officials are also coordinating and trying to um, provide some guidance for what to do in that type of a situation. And so that will be um, another type of coordination that should occur. So tentatively, you know, if, if you're not in, a, in a, an area that's a fairly straightforward site, uh, which is gonna tend to be more um, in the Bonnie Dune area, that's gonna tend to be a little easier than in the far north coast and in some areas of San Lorenzo Valley. And if you're at a more complex site, you may need clearances from environmental health regarding your septic. You may need a clearance from the fire district regarding your road access. You may need, um, not only to check in with county ge geologists to, uh, to learn whether or not you might have a hazard, you may need to retain a private consultant to do a geologic assessment or investigation. Any site that's gonna rebuild um, is going to need a soils and geotechnical report. That's a standard part of, of the building code. And it should be realized, recognized that even though some foundations, you can still see them on the sites, the, the extreme heat of the fire does change the properties of some of that concrete. And so it's really uh, generally not reusable for a new home. Most of the sites um, are not gonna need any sort of zoning or discretionary permits. Most of the sites have already had homes and it will be just a building permit. The staff report details certain instances where you might be in a coastal zone or in a special environmental area where you might need what we call a level three or, or just an administrative staff level zoning type of a permit that can be um, pursued concurrently with the building permit application in most instances. Um, so the, you know, once you pull together your plans, um, You'll be submitting them along with the soils and geotech report, any other technical reports through the what we the e plan, which is an electronic portal uh, for for submitting the plans, and those are routed to reviewing agencies um, electronically. And once it, you, the plan check occurs, then um, you pull the building permit and start construction. Yikes. Sorry about that. All right, um, so the, the board asked us to specifically concentrate on these topics here. So um, we'll go ahead and go through those. Temporary housing, we have created, uh, we have a temporary permit process. We've con created some specific guidance for temporary housing for people displaced by the fires. 
as well as an application form. And that's currently available online. We do want to emphasize that the temporary housing permit can be obtained not only for the fire damage site, but for any site within the county that allows a residential use. So in some instances, um, it might be safest and fastest to, to locate a temporary accommodation at a friend or family member's site outside of the burn area. And that's gonna be in the situations where there are these complex challenges with regard to septic geology, fire road access and such. But we are um, very open to, to any kind of, of habitable um, temporary housing, including RVs, trailers, tiny homes. Uh, someone may wanna get started with an ADU before building a major home. And, and those are all possibilities. The temporary permit will be issued um, uh, by the zoning section. It's a $500 permit. And as long as you've got the clearances and a safe site and utilities set up, then it should be a pretty straightforward. Uh, the, the public information resources um, have been made available. As you know, the Resource Recovery Center was set up at the, at the uh, arena. It's been operating uh, to, from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m., which will continue through this week. However, it'll be closed this Sunday. And then next week, it'll be open from 11 till five, Monday through Saturday. Um, initially, we were gonna close it on Sunday, September 27th. That's now been changed to Wednesday, September 30th. There's a website that uh, contains um, quite a bit of information. It has the damage assessment map. It has detailed information on rebuilding, debris removal, wells, water, links to other agencies such as FEMA, uh, links to resource conservation district information about the effects of wildfire on your property, erosion control, et cetera. So there's a lot of information that's already on this website and more information continues to be added as it's developed. In terms of the streamline uh, permit process, I mentioned that that is if you are reconstructing a home that's um, had on a site that had a legal home on it before, and if you don't exceed the size of that home by about 10% and you're in roughly the same location, that's gonna be the most straightforward pathway to a reconstruction. However, it is possible to go ahead and propose a, a larger than 10% um, size and, um, and some, a somewhat different location on your site. It's just that that's probably gonna be a little bit less streamlined, um, but it should still be building permit only. The, the um, order of magnitude in terms of the, the, the type of and location of damage, we thought people might be interested. You know, if, if you say, let's say there's about a thousand homes that have been lost, rough numbers, about 50% of those, about 500, should be this relatively straightforward reconstruction type of house. The other 50% located in more challenging areas of San Lorenzo Valley and in the remote, remote North Coast, about half of those are probably gonna require the most, more focused geologic investigation or identification of other mitigations to address challenges. You, uh, the board asked for uh, information about fees and uh, potential to reduce fees. Uh, not all fees can be waived because we are um, bringing on a consultant to deal with the volume of the, the numbers of permit applications that we expect. So we do need to pay that consultant and staff costs related to the building plan review and issuance as well as inspections of the, the houses once they're under construction. But since we can anticipate where these homes are and there's a certain volume of activity going on, we have uh, decided that some of the normal routings and the flat fees charged by reviewing agencies will not be necessary. So the column on the right sort of goes through about $6,000 in n fees that are normally charged, which we will not be charging for reconstruction projects. 
It's also a recommendation that the board authorize us to collect the building plan check fee at the time of building permit issuance, rather than right up front when somebody submits. So there would be some fees that we would take in up front. And in this example, it's a, the example of, of fees is given for a 2000 square foot house in Bonnie Dune. Uh, so a fairly straightforward house that does not involve um, redoing a septic or special geologic challenges um, and things of that nature. So that would be about $4,000 in fees due at the time you submit the application. And then once it was all plan checked and ready to issue, it would be about another 7,000 in fees charged. Since it's a reconstruction project, there would be no impact fees that would be charged. So um, that's the information on the fees. So the, we are anticipating that most of the reconstructed homes would use the same access road and driveways. And generally, you know, as I said before, that in some areas that that's okay. In some areas, those roads don't actually meet current code and maybe they've shrunken over time or deteriorated or never met code in the first place. So the fire protection officials in particular are, are meeting and um, deciding uh, what sort of processes will be available to homeowners that live in those type of challenging access situations. And that, that's an ongoing discussion. There's um, potentially some, some programmatic mitigation or in lieu fees that can create a fund to carry out some road improvements to the benefit of a group of, of homeowners. That's the type of thing that, that's under discussion. The, um, we've already mentioned that any septic system has to meet current state standards. Um, there, there, there's not an option to not meet current state standards with septic systems. So in some locations, uh, there will need to be an alternate or enhanced septic system installed. Regarding the, um, the geologic hazards, there is um, unfortunately um, another, another threat that is developing. This slide illustrates the effect of fire on soil profiles and how fire creates a new level of hazard. I know we're all weary of threats to our safety and security in this year 2020 that has already presented us with unprecedented levels of challenge. But now we have a different and increased hazard that's a result of the fire activity. The slide at the left illustrates a pre-fire normal condition with vegetation, bugs, leaf litter, topsoil, a condition where rainfall is absorbed. The middle slide shows what happens when the fire occurs. It destroys all the carbon rich trees and vegetation, essentially cooks the material both above and below ground, leaves ash, and it leaves a condition which is shown at the far right where the so dirt has lost its porosity, it's lost its ability to absorb and hold water and rainfall even on the order of a quarter inch in a 15 minute time interval can in some locations create runoff in larger volumes than had occurred in before the fire. So that means that ash, loose soil, rocks, other material can flow down slope at a high velocity and impact things in its path, including structures. So this hazard exists in some areas within the burn area and even in some areas nearby outside of the burn area. There was a watershed emergency response team called WERT. That's a multi-agency post-fire hazard assessment team that includes CAL FIRE, both the US and California Geological Survey and other professionals. And they've completed a preliminary report which the county geologist and others are further refining in order to characterize this debris flow landslide hazard. And that's this, this increased level of hazard is one of the reasons for why in some areas we are going to require that rebuild sites check in with the county, county geologist and, and screening information to get the status of their site with regard to this hazard. The other um, challenge that we're all aware of is 
that in, in the burn area, there were a number of sites where structures never did get a, a permit. Sometimes the sites themselves were never permitted. Um, and sometimes they were, and so that is our most complex adaptive challenge is how to address unpermitted structures as part of this rebuilding uh, process. We don't have all, all the answers yet, but uh, we've collectively identified a couple of options for your consideration. We need to work more on those options, but option one would be to treat structures built prior to 1986 just as legal non-conforming structures. This is the way we currently treat structures that exist before 1956, because the county never had a building code. It didn't have codes. And so we, we just accept, we grandfather in everything as legal if it's prior to 1956. Uh, potentially we could adopt a different threshold and say that things built prior to 1986 where before we have, you know, we have a little less than perfect record keeping in some instances, and we could just deem all of the 1986, uh, pre-86 structures to be legal non-conforming. Uh, that might help quite a few sites, um, but then again, the new construction is still going to need to meet current codes. Some of those sites are still going to have some of the challenges related to geology, septic and, and fire road access. Under option two, that was something we're calling the fire area improvement reconstruction program tentatively. That would be where, where it wasn't a pre 86 construction site. It could be of any age, but it was unpermitted. And, and under this option, we're basically, we know that they can't meet road access or there's a really, really challenging situation that is not gonna enable that site to fully comply with the codes, even though they would be able to build a new a, a home that complies with the building code, there are other codes that affect the rebuilding. And, and under option two, we're basically, we know that there's, it's gonna be very challenging. So the thing to explore there with uh, fire districts and other agency partners is the potential for a programmatic type of a mitigation. Maybe you would set up an in-lieu fee program and take you know, money from, from similarly situated sites, put them in a, in a kitty and use that collection of funds to make improvements, say to a road, turnouts or retaining wall, widening here and there, what have you. So that is um, a very early thought and it has not been further developed. And we're recommending that um, the agencies continue to talk over the next couple of months and report back to you on, on November 17th. So in summary, uh, the current, this is what's currently going on then as we are completing, uh, refining the, the data related to the damage assessment, the hazardous material and debris removal. Um, those programs are, are coming together and will start soon. We're uh, interviewing consultants to hire assistance with the building permit processing and we expect to have a contract back to the board by October 6th. We're examining the unified fee schedule and whether there need to be any changes made to facilitate reconstruction to reflect these waived or reduced costs. One thing that's happening in terms of the streamlining, um, as I said, we've decided that we don't necessarily have to route to all of the normal agencies we route to. And one of the reasons why we feel like we can do that is um, we, knowing where these sites are, we can predetermine some of these specifications and protocols that need to be incorporated into the project plans. Um, so the environmental plan specifications, DPW protocols and specifications, we hope to, we're developing documents and hope to get them on the website so that they'd be available for downloading and incorporating into building permit plans. Uh, and that will streamline um, compliance reviews and, and all, allow not having to route um, plans to some agencies. We're looking at the, the code um, as well to see whether there's any additional amendments that might be needed to best accommodate the reconstruction activity. Um, I've already talked about the environmental health, fire and permitting agencies trying to 
think through some of the more global challenges that are going to exist in some areas. So the the you know those challenges are, are some of the more difficult policy and implementation considerations, and uh, the next near term challenge that's somewhat related to rebuilding, but exists even if someone's not rebuilding or may live outside of the burn area is this increased geologic hazard that we're all becoming um, more, much more aware of because of the, the changes to the burn area, the loss of vegetation, et cetera, et cetera. There is a higher risk of debris flow landslides. That, that risk is elevated by rain, even at modest levels. There's, there's some erosion control and, and some things that can be done to reduce the extent of it. But really um, in the first couple of winters, at least from what we're hearing from, from other jurisdictions is that it, it can't be fully mit mitigated ahead of time that, that the strategy includes evacuating people during, in these areas at risk. So this is a, a big new issue. Um, and we're not, it's not the intention of this item today to, to go into detail on it. Um, we are preparing a presentation of the work report and the you know, water and geology and uh, public safety aspects of this. And we'll be scheduling a presentation for the special meeting of, of September 29th of the board. It's going to be necessary to in educate, inform, prepare property owners for this winter. And so there'll, there'll be other follow-up meetings needed as well. Um, so that concludes my report. And again, I just wanted to, to um, emphasize that this report is the result of effort from staff from many departments, many agencies, many divisions, and um, a lot of th th those staff and expertise is available to you either remotely or in this room, uh, should you have any questions. So the recommended actions are, were on page one of the staff report. And um, not sure if you want me to read all those off or that now, or that we can do that after any discussion or, or public comment, that, whichever you prefer. Okay, great. We wanna maybe ask uh, Supervisor Coonerty or McPherson to speak first. I yeah, think this is, thank you. This is Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, first, I wanna thank uh, both Ms. Malloy and all the relevant department heads for putting us together so quickly and comprehensively and showing your commitment to helping people uh, rebuild in a, in a timely manner. I thought I thought thought the work was really professional and took lessons from other communities uh, that have experienced similar events. And um, and so hopefully we aren't we aren't re reinventing the wheel. And in fact, we'll have a better wheel uh, for people uh, as they rebuild. I did have a couple questions. First, in the staff report, it seemed to indicate that the county would be paying for the geotechnical work. But then in your comments, it sounded like people needed to retain their own geotechnical consultant. Can you clarify that? Yes, um, what, what I put in, in the staff report is, you know, we have a county geologist, Jeff Nolan, and who's we're extremely fortunate to have on staff. He has a wealth of experience in this area, decades worth of, of, of experience. And what, I, what we're proposing is that he not need to bill out his time, you know, on any particular applications. We think that the geologic hazard is a, is um, a broader hazard. It's a somewhat diffuse hazard. It's not necessarily just site specific. And so his expertise in, in terms of informing uh, the character of the hazard and, and assisting people to, to try to address it, we don't want to have to charge for his time. Um, However, you know, once he has gotten to the point of determining that there is gr more work, that, that, that there is an elevated hazard on a particular site and that we do need a geologic study or investigation site specific. At that point, um, the property owner will need to hire their own professional. 
And, and likewise with the soils and ge geotechnical report, that's a standard part of, of pretty much any new house um, application. It's, and so soils and geotechnical reports, that's where you do the site specific study of the location you wanna build and they come up with the design um, parameters for the foundation and for the, the, uh, the home. So that is a, a very specific report specific to the home that's proposed to be reconstructed. And that would be need to be paid for by the private property owner. And um, I guess there's two follow-up questions to that. The first is, uh, I mean, do we, this sort of two-step process, do we have the capacity to move quickly from our side? And is there also the local capacity uh, in the in the private sector, consultant sector, to be able to get these reports in a timely way to, to homeowners looking to rebuild? Um, I, I do know that local uh, geotechnical professionals are also meeting and trying to get ready for the demand that may be placed on them. Uh, what we're doing at the county is that we, uh, and this may be a, a code amendment that we bring back, it is that we would not be doing our uh, peer reviews of the soils and geotechnical reports. Normally we do peer review, we do an in-house peer review. And in this instance, as long as the soils uh, geotechnical report was stamped by a professional, we would not do the peer review. So that saves time and money. Um, we, we, again, we're exploring the consultant services contract and should we identify um, further need, uh, there's that option to maybe bring it on through the consultant contract. And, um, and in the staff report, it also mentions the possibility of a, of a sort of a neighborhood-based assessment. Um, is that, is what, what could we look at there in terms of, uh, you know, for instance, in the Pine Ridge neighborhood in, in Bonnie Dune, doing a geotechnical report for that, for that whole area? Well, I, I'm not um, a geotechnical engineer myself, so there are probably better people that can answer this question than me. However, um, I do know that, you know, it's gonna rely on the, the professionals feeling that they do, there's enough similarly situated conditions, predictable soil um, and, and ge geology conditions that the design solution is gonna be similar for a batch of similarly situated, similarly located areas. Maybe that will occur in some of the Bonnie Dune areas. I think that we, we pretty much do not expect that to occur in the San Lorenzo Valley because there's a lot of variation from, from property to property. Um, and so a, a site-specific uh, report, it, it, it's not all that expensive and it will define the specific engineering considerations that need to be taken on that site to, to support the new home. Okay. Um, the, another question is um, the timeline. So, so the requirement that everyone have a uh, up to code septic system. Uh, some people may have functioning septic systems, but not up to code. Is there a way that if we can allow them to rebuild and then then give them three to five years to to bring their septic system uh, up to code uh, or up to current standards, is that is that a possibility? Um, I think Marilyn Underwood of Environmental Health is is participating in this call and she would probably be the best person to answer that question. Hello. Um, as far as septic systems, um, again, uh, we're talking about permitted septic Oops, I'm getting some feedback. Yes. Maybe I'll try to correct that. Okay. Um, good afternoon. I think it's afternoon already. Um, as far as septic systems, so again, we're talking with a permitted septic system and distinguishing it from those properties where it's not permitted. We'll, we'll talk about that separately. So if the septic system in doing a replacement home, they would like to um, essentially build the same size home with the same number of bedrooms, uh, then, and it met, um, current standards, meaning um, 83 to 2018, then they would be able to re uh, rebuild and use that septic system again, making sure that it wasn't damaged and, and bring it up to um, current code. 
if they wanted to expand and upgrade or it wasn't meeting current code, they would meet, need to be bring up to current code standards. I um, hope that helps explain it. Yes, and can you, while, while we have you, can you, uh, I had asked Ms. Malloy about the capacity of staff. Um, can you talk about your capacity for these septic and well inspections um, in order and in order to to manage this process and whether we need an outside consultant as we are planning with the with the permitting process? Sure, um, we would welcome the assistance. I think um, you know we too do not see this what we anticipate the volume of folks coming forward to uh, need our review. Um, so that is part of the consultants that we're looking at. I will say at this point, we'll be chatting with them about their capacity to provide that. They're not typically those kind of, uh, they typically tend to be consultants more on the planning side that, rather than the septic. But I do know they're, um, that is something we're interested in them tr trying to help us with. Great, thank you. And then uh, back to Ms. Malloy, uh, two other questions. One is the idea of um, for temporary housing, only allowing one additional person per property. Um, you could imagine that there are, are communities that have worked collaboratively and they may want more than one. And if the septic or and other systems allow it, would we would we be okay with that? I think that that we we would take the board's direction on that. You know, tentatively, we've said that. You know, if there were was one home there before, then you can put a temporary one temporary there. Uh, we've also said that you do need to be connected to you, the utility system, so power, um, septic or sewer, um, and the other one. <laughs> Any, anyway, um, you know, if 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 the systems can handle it, then then if that's your direction that you'd like us to entertain evaluating the system and seeing whether more than one temporary accommodation can be located on one site, then we can certainly explore that. Uh, probably the, the septic is probably gonna be the, the most tricky item there. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think it is worth exploring if, if, they, if it can all be done safely. Uh, my last question has to do with the power. Um, I understand being hooked up to utilities, uh, but that puts a lot of, uh, uh, takes a lot of control out of, for people to, to sort of get back on their site. Um, there are alternatives to uh, just a generator, um, solar and battery storage or others, other ways that people could, could provide power. Are we open to, um, to that if, if it's gonna take a long time for them to get uh, the power utility restored? Yeah, I think that the building official could probably speak to that. I, um, in general, you know, we, we don't, we want to strongly discourage the use of generators um, for a longer term established residential occupancy of a site. You know, generators are really supposed to be for emergency generators, you know, short periods of time. Um, there, it can also create hazards if you haven't transferred the power and if you're feeding back into the grid, uh, that can be a hazardous situation. So I think, you know, the building official is open to alternate power sources and can can have a dialogue with um, the property owners and evaluate their proposals. But yes, solar, battery storage, um, take it case by case. Uh, in general though, I think PG&E is, is pretty well, getting pretty well established to restore power and will be able to release and, and uh, allow for power to be dropped back onto the sites. Great. Thank, thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I, I just can't uh, overstate uh, the work represented in this comprehensive report um, is really astonishing. And I can't express my enough of my appreciation to the planning, public works, and environmental health agencies and uh, the county for their hard work and getting this uh, to this point as quickly as possible. Um, I think we're just at the starting point of this and we, we know it's going to be some time. Uh, so I, I, first of all, none of us can uh, recognize the 
Well, the hopelessness or just the, the emptiness of these people, the, the 900 plus people who have lost their homes. So uh, I just want to sh make sure that you know that we are trying to work as quickly as we can. We understand the, the potential hazards if we go too quickly and don't do it correctly when we rebuild. So I, I really uh, want to thank planning and the other departments, uh, public works and environmental health for getting these, uh, these proposals to us as quickly as possible. Uh, the complexity and the urgency of it uh, combined is, uh, well, we're not gonna make it overwhelming. We're just gonna have to try to get to it as best we can. And it is encouraging to uh, let people know that through their first phase uh, of the cleanup, that there would be no cost to the uh, property owners because of Cal uh, the EPA the Environmental Protection Agency, and then in phase two with the Cal Recycle helping um, to help at no cost as well. So I hope that is of some comfort to some of the, uh, the homeowners for the basic cleanup that will have to be done. Um, is uh, And one of the most promising aspects is acknowledgement that the turnaround time for permits to site uh, temporary housing quickly uh, and then rebuild um, in the same footprint is foremost on the minds of, uh, of the survivors. Uh, they wanna get their lives back, of course, and to do that, they need a clear path that is uh, predictable, affordable, and feasible. Um, the, uh, this report de demonstrates clearly that the, the county recognizes your concerns. And so I just want to let people generally know that I think mine and I think I know all the rest of the board's concerns are that uh, the county will be guided by the principles of uh, process that is predictable in terms of time frame and cost. Um, and the fees charged by the county, are they, for, uh, are they reasonable and are they affordable? Uh, are the permit requirements feasible given the extensive challenges, especially the rules around the, the two most difficult problem areas we face involving um, the septic systems as, as has been mentioned and the fire access or the roads to some of these uh, dwellings. Um, I think the, the key uh, that we're establishing in these protocols is for when the soils and geological work will be required and to what level of detail. Uh, realistically, um, I've heard that per, we could probably do about 50 to 100 of these per week. Is that a, a good guess? Uh, we have 900 homes that are plus that are down, but I'm just trying to get a realistic uh, outlook of how quickly we can go on this with the agencies that are coming in to review the geological impacts, uh, the potential geological impacts as we go through the rebuilding process. Do you have any estimate of how quickly we can do this? I mean, in number of uh, parcels, uh, is it about 50 to 100 a week, realistically? Well, realistically, um, the, the, sometimes the less predictable time that it takes for reconstruction is on the side of the private property owner you know, gathering resources, getting a designer, getting the clearances, um, figuring out your septic system, um, making, seeing whether you need that geology, geotechnical report, getting that done. So once, and we will, we're here to, to help, you know, we'll, we'll have a lot of information and resources and hopefully some, um, a lot of guidance available to help, but there's a lot that the property owner will need to do. Once that's all together and submitted to the county, then that's what we're gearing up for, to get sufficient consultant assistance and the protocols established that we can process them very quickly. In Sonoma County, for instance, once someone gets all that together and submits a complete application, then they were getting a permit within a week, you know, five to seven working days. And that's what we are going to try to replicate here in Santa Cruz County. But I do need to emphasize that, that there are challenges that um, are gonna take some time on the property owner side of things. And, uh, you know, as, as has been mentioned, you know, securing the consultant, getting the study done, getting the designer, getting your finances together, all of that is, is we know 
um, quite a, a daunting task. Some people are better at building than others. And so we're, we're here ready to help, but that's really probably the most uncertainty is, is how long it takes people to be ready to submit. I don't know that we would anticipate getting 100 applications ready all at once in that same week. Right, I understand. I, I really do commend the uh, public works stormwater staff uh, uh, developing a checklist that eliminates the need to route or permit applications to them for review. Uh, so I, th I really think it's uh, that checklist is important and people should have access or make access to it. Uh, I still have some questions. Um, I'm concerned about the, the septic standards, which I think are the biggest stumbling block in this whole rebuild recovery process, especially if enhanced treatment is frequently required and the regional Water Quality Control Board must approve the permit. Um, what can the county do to push back if the regional board makes these requirements too onerous? Uh, and secondly, does FEMA or insurance cover the cost of rebuilding septic systems or help with the cost of upgrading those systems? I think that's a question for Marilyn Underwood. I think so, yeah. Um, as far as the cost of upgrading, I, I am not aware of uh, funds that could be used for that. Certainly, um, if folks have insurance, uh, insurance often covers upgrades to meet current codes. Uh, for those that don't have that coverage, I'm not aware of any funding. Um, certainly something I think it would be worthwhile pursuing uh, with you and the board, uh, but I'm not aware of any. Okay. Um, and I, we've talked about the the choke, uh, uh, the choke point in applications is going to be the number of staff that are available, and I think you've already answered some of that. Um, the, the fire access is a big issue, um, and many of the non-conforming roads uh, were used successfully by fire personnel during this incident. Uh, so it seems that flexibility in the standards is needed. Uh, what influence does the county have uh, in advocating for flexible fire road access uh, with CAL FIRE and the community fire districts? Do we need to get there okay uh, under those circumstances or is it the Department of, well, who, uh, who will we need to uh, address uh, outside of the county to help us answer that question as quickly as possible if those roads can be you know, actually used? CAL FIRE is the county's fire department. There are four, three other fire districts um, with independent authority and, and decision-making um, that are located in areas of Vern. So I do know that uh, Chief Ian Larkin is here and had planned to address you. So um, he, he, I think he was planning on coming up during public comment and, and speaking a bit about, okay. about this issue. Oh, I'll wait for that. The, the I, I can't see it. I don't know if he's, I'm going to wait for that. We could, we could have him come up. Like. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Good afternoon, Chair Caput, uh, members of the board. Uh, uh, Supervisor McPherson, uh, the direct answer to your question is, um, we're gonna have to look at those very uh, specifics on each of the properties uh, and how it relates to that road access. Um, though I'm empathetic to everybody's uh, uh, concerns uh, in the loss of their structures, um, it, a lot of these roads are not built to any standards. And in order for us to move forward from this, we do need to make sure that we improve any accesses that we possibly can uh, through this process of, uh, of the rebuilding phase. Um, so uh, a lot of those are gonna have to be a one-on-one um, uh, -on -one, uh, circumstance for each of those uh, given properties. Uh, so to speak to them in a general term, uh, I think it's gonna have to be a, a larger discussion that we have uh, as we move through this uh, rebuilding uh, phase. Okay, all right. Um, there, um, my understanding from the, uh, the survivors that um, there's a scarcity of critical building materials uh, and uh, one, one discovered that replacement sheds are back ordered and there's already a two month waiting period. Uh, do you have any general uh, thoughts on that? I don't know who might be able to say that, what's going on in the private sector because there's been so many fires throughout the state, but uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the scarcity of materials. That's not our responsibility, so to speak, but uh, 
that's going to be a big issue. I just want to let people know we recognize that. And uh, so we'll try to do what we can to get our uh, fair share through um, the private enterprise uh, throughout the state of California uh, about the need here. Uh, because I, my understanding is that, I, I don't know, I can't remember the exact last count that we have in our daily up, updates. I think there's some more than 4,000 structures that were destroyed. This is uh, residential buildings and we have over 900 of them or clearly about 20, almost 25 quarter of them. So uh, we're in uh, a great need. And so I think we will do what we can to, uh, through the avenues that are available to see that we can get the materials that are needed for the great number of structures that were destroyed in our county. Um, you know, one other thing, I have about 20 properties that I know of to date and that have sand hills habitat that is likely to be present. Are we going to charge them fees to rebuild or how do those fees, how will those uh, fees be used for the public good rather than enrich the, the land bank? Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about that. It's, it's a small number of the total number of uh, structures destroyed to my knowledge at this point, but uh, it is a huge concern. So, uh, for those 20, about 20 structures located in the Sand Hills habitat, if they go back um, and locate on the previously disturbed area that had already been disturbed and they're a reconstruction and they're not really going to be disturbing any new areas of habitat, then, then no, they wouldn't need to pay any mitigation fees. If the property owner has a desire to expand the footprint, that's where the uh, participation in the habitat bank would be um, would come up and i think the current fees are about seven dollars a square foot it is a private bank um they a, a private entity established it and administers it and and decides what the amount of the fee is right okay um and uh, fine, i appreciate the streamlined process to um, site temporary residences like uh, rvs or tiny homes but what if a larger family needs to be accommodated? Can they cite more than one unit for temporary housing on their uh, parcel? Again, at, at the direction of the board, if that's something you would like us to explore, we can do that. Um, obviously the bottom line is gonna be that the appropriate water power and, and septic um, and, and safety considerations are, are met at the site. But if that's a direction that you'd like us to incur, you know, in terms of an emergency disaster response and a temporary situation, then that's something that we can look into. Um, again, I, I just want to say thank you to a very comprehensive report that uh, I think answers many of the questions. There might be some special circumstances, of course, but what you have done and put together to try to get try to get us back uh, on on our feet or that those who lost their homes as quickly as possible is truly impressive. And I can't overstate how, um, how pleased I am with the Public Works Environmental Health and Planning Departments in putting this package together. Um, we all know, and I want the public to know, we know time is of the essence, who knows what this winter is gonna bring and we need to get there as quickly as possible. And when I went up, have gone up to look at um, the damage uh, to the trees, uh, there's not hundreds, there's thousands, and they're trying to uh, chop those up and so we can get some cover for the uh, for the, uh, the hillsides. And uh, in the San Lorenzo Valley, we have some special circumstances with the geological uh, situation that we have there. Uh, it's gonna be very challenging, but we're gonna go as quickly and compassionately as we can to get you back on your feet and uh, and, what the work that you have done is gonna help us get there. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Chair. I think that Supervisor Coonerty and Supervisor McPherson have covered it. And thank you, Ms. Malloy, for your continued work on this. Uh, the, uh, Chair, I just, uh, I appreciate uh, the work that's gone on and I appreciate the comments and actually leadership from my colleagues, Supervisor McPherson and, and Coonerty to, to give us this direction um, about uh, what the uh, county should be doing. In relation to a question that Supervisor Coonerty asked about geotech um, and the investigations and the, and the, you know, the, the, the concern that there may not be enough folks, would it be, 
in our interest to contract with a drilling company that could do the borings and have the local local consultants review the information. I mean, just sort of getting those borings seems to be uh, incredibly important. Is that something to take a look at? Uh, I just offer that as a suggestion. Okay. Um, I think it's worthwhile. And uh, um, when in my conversations with uh, planning and public work staff, I have heard a, a deep sense of commitment to uh, helping people out uh, as best as possible. And I'm confident in the women and men in, those, in, in our departments and environmental health as well to be able to, to, to meet this moment and help these people get back in their house as quickly as possible. There's great skill that we have in these offices and, and I'm sure that if we are committed to figuring out a way to how to get to the yes, rather than figuring out how to get to a no, we can make this happen. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I have a, just a couple of questions. You don't have to, you know, elaborate on them, but uh, homeowners hazard insurance and life insurance are kind of similar in the sense you pay for it and you hope you never have to use it. So with uh, some people with the pandemic and maybe they lost their job or whatever, it's a what if question. What if they didn't pay their uh, current uh, homeowners uh, insurance? Uh, I know we couldn't evict people uh, if they couldn't pay the rent. I wonder with uh, some people who weren't able to pay their homeowners hazard insurance, uh, the insurance company is not gonna be able to say, hey, you paid for 10 year, 20 years, but you were uh, four months late this time and we canceled your. Yeah, I really don't know the answer to that question, but I will say that at the Resource Recovery Center, there is an agency, um, a nonprofit agency that specifically um, provides information about the insurance type of questions. And so sure. that's a resource for people. Yeah, that'll be something state will be involved with probably. And uh, I'm sure some of, you know, it affects some, not just in our county, but maybe in the other counties in California. Chair Cabot, if I could make a comment, this is Nicole. Hi, <laughs> so I just wanted to add, you know, FEMA has the application open right now for disaster assistance. It's gonna be open until October 21st. So anyone who requires assistance, we encourage them to go either to the Resource Recovery Center or go online. I believe the website is through FEMA. It's disasterassistance.gov. And folks can apply both for rental assistance and assistance for their, their home repairs. So if people are insured or underinsured, you know, they should go take a look at that and apply for the assistance. Yeah, okay. And then I, I guess with FEMA, uh, the other thing would be uh, if you're underinsured, is FEMA's gonna, are they gonna help out? And let's, you know, some people don't want too much ins insurance, so they might maybe don't uh, uh, have full coverage. Correct, so uh, during the application process, FEMA's gonna ask for homeowner's insurance, and so they'll look at, you know, what you're insured at, and take into consideration if you're insured or underinsured. So that's part of the process. Okay. And then uh, I guess the tough question is uh, uh, of the, let's say 950 homes uh, after all of them have been you know, discovered, uh, are, how many would, or we're not gonna permit to rebuild because of potential landslides or whatever? There are some that we're not I, It's really way too early to try to, to guess on, on whether and how many sites won't be able to rebuild. Like we certainly, we just don't have that information you have yet. To, you're gonna go step by step. Right. Okay. And current code changes, will that affect uh, some of the people being able to rebuild? No, what do you mean by current code changes? Well, the, uh, the ones we did earlier this morning? You know, or? If, we, if we have a code change, we're, you know. Building code? Yeah. Okay, well the last cycle of the building code was just went into effect um, the beginning of this year. So the same building code is gonna be in effect for the next three years, two and, two and a half years. So. Um, Thank you. 
And well, uh, we'll open up. Mr. Mr. Chair, I just uh, this is Supervisor McPherson again. I, I think there's a lot of things that are on our plate and that we have to uh, look at, but I, I'd like to, if when we come to a motion to, uh, and there's a lot of directions that are that are proposed, uh, about it, we that staff investigate um, hiring a soils uh, sample consultant to do the majority of the field work and the possibility um, of citing additional temporary housing for larger families. Uh, I just uh, would like to uh, mention that I think that we're going to need some additional help here, and uh, I, I think it would be a good thing to uh, for an additional direction to see uh, if we can hire a soils um, consultant and uh, and just get a sense of how much that would be and for how long. Okay, and uh, we'll open up the. Uh, uh, with the hearing uh, to uh, the public, public comments. Good afternoon, my name is James Ewing Whitman. I've been a resident here for since 94 and planet Earth since 1967. I don't pertain to know much of anything specialized. I have a minor in geology and in physical and cultural anthropology and several degrees in underwater basket weaving. I do legal research, I do legal writing I listened to what was going on here, and I don't want to deliver a corporate shit sandwich. I wish I had three hours to do so, I could. Um, what's not being addressed in the eight items that I wrote down? Um, what is FEMA really going to do for us? FEMA's been in control of the United States, to my knowledge, since March 13th, 2020. Um, what's going to happen with the property owners that never had a legal residence, but they did win a lawsuit against the County of Santa Cruz about 40 years ago. I'm particularly talking about the Lost Chance area. Um, and what's gonna happen when there's exposure about how these storms have really happened? I'm not really just addressing Santa Cruz County. Santa Cruz County is about 900,000 residents. Planet Earth, 700,000 residents. Planet Earth has about 7 billion. So we're just one in 10,000. So I'm kind of more addressing what happened last week, and that is the fires on the West Coast and what's going on in other counties with weather damage. Um, so if these things are all determined to be directed energy weapons, Lloyd's London is the largest insurance company in the world. They do not cover wireless frequency damages. So I'm hoping that this conversation and conversations like this are gonna be happening in counties all over the West Coast and all over the United States. Because what happened almost a month ago in Santa Cruz County, unfortunately was caused by those who are in control of the US military. And that's a corporation that's in control of the whole US Congress and that filters down to even this county and all counties. And that is the Rand Corporation. And the Rand Corporation, its mother and father are the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers. And the Rothschilds have been funding both sides of the war for more than 200 years. The Rothschilds own PG&E. So at some point, the citizens should get together and really work with each other to figure out the long-term plans for the future unborn children. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. So I, and I'm sure many others, find it rather reprehensible, the idea that the county would actually be trying to profit off of all the loss that so many families have just incurred. So I would like to propose that all permit fees are completely waived for all the survivors of these fires. Why on earth would we even consider charging them to rebuild their homes, considering the extent of this disaster? I'd further like to propose that the county use some of the $500 million that is revenue from property taxes every year, over $500 million, to help fund uh, not only the inspection process, but also any sort of other designers or um, other type of soil testing or anything else that's needed to help these homeowners out. <clears throat> and, um, 
again, it, anyone who had any sort of structure at all, everyone should be able to rebuild anything that they had, unless it was actually causing some sort of danger, true bodily harm or danger to, to someone else, which obviously isn't the case or would have been a case in and of itself before the fires. So the idea that we're gonna use these fires as an opportunity to um, take things away from families, take away their, their you know, little structure they had in the backyard or whatever else that it was that wasn't permitted is really pretty ridiculous. So I think pretty much as long as they can show that there was a structure there, they should be able to rebuild and have all the Assistance necessary to rebuild as good, if not better, than it was originally. And again, all permits should be, all permit fees should be waived. And any assistance that's needed, soil testing, designers, all that should be covered, should be taken out of the 500 million plus dollars that's, take, that's brought in as revenue to this county every year in property tax. And especially since the schools are doing distance learning right now. Um, the, the percentage of that property tax that is supposed to go towards schools, which covers utilities and, prop, and uh, property maintenance and all those other things, seems like it could very easily be used to help out these homeowners and their families. Thank you. Thank you. I, I believe the insurance companies would pay for the, the permit fees and everything and, and all that, right? That's included? It, it, I, I, it depends on the policy. I mean, it's, it's not the, the person who lost the home that has to come up out of their savings. Hi, Mary Lou Sams Wiley. I can attest to your last statement. It depends on the policy you purchased. I had a great one with travelers, 100% plus 50, all code upgrades came out of a separate kitty. Okay. So it just depends on what you purchased. And that's why we need to upgrade. So my thing is if it would be helpful to have a preliminary checklist, punch list requirements for each area, because the county is, does not want to take liability for doing all the soil samples, because if they make a boo-boo, the county's going to be liable. But if the geologist report was rather recent for the area, a group possibility for a group report, and then overlay the different properties on top of it to help make it a little bit less expensive for the homeowners, because it's their responsibility, unfortunately. Now, Speaking to the rural areas, they're more off the grid. Cal Fire, uh, which I flew under the, the, got mine in before it got upgraded, their paved road to the rural areas has to be 18 to 20 feet wide before permits, you get a permit issued to put up a stick of wood. That's what I was told, I got lucky. Um, and the required 10,000 gallons of water two 5,000 gallon tanks, a wharf hydrant with placement determined by um, CAL FIRE has to be done also. Those are expensive and that's a lot of stuff that needs to get done. And many of these places with the um, higher up the mountain or last chance or whatever, it's not gonna support those wider roads. And some of those unfortunately people may not be able to rebuild unless they get creative and work together, move their house site a little closer together to make it a little less painful in the pocketbook. But then again, that's a stipulation that now they're moving away from their housing, original house site to move someplace else and that'll open up another can of worms. Um, the septic rebuild cost and repayment, again, depends on your insurance company, what you paid for. And if you have an extra, if you have two kitchens in the house instead of one. Each kitchen has to have a separate septic tank. You can't put it into one. It's just not allowed with the permits and there may have been some more code upgrades since then, but it would be helpful for Cal Fire to go to each site and let the person know or put it in the report which areas are gonna need what so the person can make a better determination. Am I gonna be able to rebuild? And if they're not able to rebuild because of cost, is that site buildable at all? Because all of a sudden they went from having a nice nest egg to having nothing. Just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Glenn Gruner with CFH Construction. I just want to say that it's amazing what our firemen did. They told us 20,000 structures are going to burn. I'm sorry that we had 980 burn. They did an amazing job. Our sheriff's done an amazing job. So I just wanted to say that. Our construction company, 
We build tiny houses, we build ADUs. I've been talking with um, chips and drywall, I've been talking USG, I've been talking Golden State Lumber. We have the ability to help these people in the short term get in. In the longer term down the road, we can help. So our company, I've been talking with uh, David Reed, I've sent uh, McPherson um, uh, 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 stuff to everybody, to all the supervisors. I sent tiny houses. We can build tiny houses fast, we can build them on our property. So I'm just here today that we're here to help we're trying to beat down the prices for these people. We're trying to make costs lower. We've got our windows, we got doors, we got windows, I mean everything. We got metal, metal studs, we got uh, roofers available, we got our framers available. So with all that said, that's what I'm here for. I'm not here to market my company, I'm here to help these people. So that's what CFHE Inc is. Everybody's got my information. We're here to help, we can start tomorrow. Thank you. And later, later down the road, we can help on the septic tanks and everything else. Okay. So thank you to the firemen. Good afternoon. This is, I'm Becky Steinbrenner. Uh, thank you, sir, for that. I also want to bring up that there are tough sheds also available. You see them at Home Depot. Those could also be a very quick and affordable temporary shelter. Supervisor McPherson, I'd like to thank you for pulling together your town hall meeting. Um, I got that notice and I really applaud you for your excellent outreach and information to your constituents. I'm concerned that um, there will be many bottlenecks in all of this. I'm happy to hear that the EPA is gonna come in and help the environmental health with the um, phase one hazardous materials evaluations. But what about the uh, CAL FIRE's bottleneck? If they have to approve all the roads, their resources are very limited. And I ask that you bring up Chief Larkin and maybe um, um, Chris Walters to address that issue. That's a big one. If we're going to require that all roads be improved to current standards, how would the drainage be affected in these uh, fragile areas by paved roads that will now have a lot more drainage. I think the geotechnical report is a big hurdle for a lot of people to get over and having done a lot of work on my road that required geotech, they're also in short supply. They always have been and now it will be even worse. So I'd like to ask that instead of having a brand new geotech report, if you've got one that's been done and approved and nothing has majorly changed with a site, just get it looked at and not have to go through all of those borings. That's gonna be a huge bottleneck and a huge expense for people. We learned a lot in the summit fire from Coralitos. Why are we not applying that here now? Uh, we learned what happens in those mountainous soils when the rains come. You heard many people this morning from Last Chance, they were off the grid to begin with. So why are they being required to hook up to PG&E now? They've got their own independent system, they're tough people and they're ready to go. They should not have to meet the same uh, requirements that a more urban area would have to do. Um, I, I really take offense that people cannot use generators as emergency power because that is, this is an emergency and people are not on the grid anyway. So there's no danger of it feeding back in. I am aware of the possibility of incinerating toilets. Many tiny homes use them. So let's allow people to use them now in these emergency times and maybe if their septic system, it does not meet the current code. I wanna know what Santa Cruz City Water Department is saying here. This is their watershed. What are we doing to prevent erosion? Um, let's work with resource conservation and do some seeding to prevent erosion going into the, the entire region's water supply. Um, and I also heard this morning on KSCO, Dr. Underwood talking that the soils would have to be trucked to San Mateo County. Why can't they be taken to Hollister? John Smith is a, a class two, or I don't know the class number, but hazardous materials go there. It's a lot closer than San Mateo County. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Chair Caput, Supervisor Ian Larkin, uh, Cal Fire, County Fire uh, Chief. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Ms. Malloy for her report. Uh, this is a very sensitive topic. Um, a lot of homes have been destroyed in a lot of areas of the county that um, have very, um, 
trouble uh, areas where they're on steep slopes or have very uh, questionable road systems that move into there. So this is a very, very um, uh, serious topic that we have to address. And uh, I think first and foremost, we have to look at the safety of our communities when we're dealing with this. Um, as it was mentioned in the report, we have the potential for debris flows in many areas of the fire due to our steep drain drainages and our mountainous terrain that we have. Along with our geological uh, anomalies we have here, we have many faults that run through the county and that, uh, trouble, you know, that adds to the trouble of the um, uh, potential for debris flows. So, um, you know, I think the uh, temporary uh, allowing of homes uh, or tiny homes or temporary homes in some of these areas is gonna be very questionable. And we have to look out for that safety. Uh, a debris flow is something that you really can't plan for. The only planning you can do for it is to get people out of its way. It's not something you can stop. It's not something that you can temper. It's gonna happen. And when it does happen, it's uh, instantaneous and it's dangerous. Uh, example is uh, in Montecito after the Thomas fire. Uh, in 2019, that uh, had no warning. Uh, they planned the best they could for it. They tried to get people out of its way, but it still was destructive and it killed a lot of people. So um, I just wanna say that uh, our approach to this is uh, for the safety of the communities. Um, and I think, uh, I can't speak for all my fire partners in the county, but I know from my perspective, uh, our uh, immediate concern is for the safety and concern of the uh, citizens of the county. So uh, when we look at these approaches, we're looking at from that aspect first. Uh, and we are, as I said before, looking at the potential for uh, individual concerns related to certain roads. And uh, the statement of roads having to be 20 foot wide and paved is not the case. Um, they actually have to uh, meet a certain standard and it's based on a slope and what kind of surface it has to have on it. So uh, those will all be discussed as we move forward in our discussions with planning and building throughout the county. So I just wanted to reiterate our first and foremost concerns of the safety of the citizens. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Wow, this is a triple today. Uh, Claire Machado, resident of Brookdale and um, building designer, California realtor and uh, co-compliance professional for the last 30 years. I work for the cities of Fremont, San Rafael, your own county for nine and a half years as your lead investigator. I've also helped people after big sur fire recently. And my main concern right now is debris and hazardous debris flow. Um, we have a huge need for erosion control, for training, money available to help property owners supplies to stabilize slopes with hay bales, straw bottles, seed and rye barley mixture. Many of your county employees, when you adopted the erosion control ordinance, including myself, were trained in how to apply that ordinance to properties. You have uh, people that can train as well as RCD on your staff. Please consider classes, immediate classes and assistance for owners. Also the e-plan e-permit system currently as um, has been identified has a problem and uh, we are getting our plans returned about after 10 days in complete notices and that takes a lot of time to recover from get back to a client get their things changed try to um, resubmit and it requires uh, some efficiency in Adobe Acrobat. So having someone available to help owners with Adobe Acrobat submittals might be helpful. Record keeping, your record keeping for unpermitted or in even permitted structures has about a five to eight percent error rate in your building and planning department records that is known after we scan the records uh, to microfilm. Just know that and people are going to have trouble. Um, issuance of temporary power poles. I have a question about that, um, especially for properties who have existing, possibly non-permitted structures that could be upgraded into second units and we can get them into a permit process relatively quickly with buildings. We just need a temporary power pole to get them in that structure and work with the building official to do so, hopefully. Bridges, helping um, owners uh, show H2, uh, H20 standards on bridges is important, having a process to do that on some of the uh, mountainous roads. Also, I have questions on the a temporary occupancy permit for structures on other properties off-site um, and structures that could qualify that we can identify for safe housing again with the chief building official with a temporary occupancy permit. I'm hoping that's available. 
Also, we have a need um, for uh, more generators. And also if we can use the um, geotechnical reports that we do have to use with environmental health so we don't have to um, dig a 14 foot excavation hole for a new septic system when we're designing. Also, you mentioned hiring a consultant for your processes. I haven't seen any type of RFP for that and what's the fair process for that as well as an appeal for any disagreement we might have with our comments. Thank you. Good afternoon, Co Britton, Mattson Britton Architects. Um, I was encouraged by a lot of things I heard. I also appreciate um, some recognition that um, a, a DPW drainage is problematic. It's uh, quite often one of the longest processes we have to deal with and redundant on um, lots of record. Uh, same thing with EP uh, environmental planning, uh, tends to be one of the longest ones and again, redundant. Uh, in many instances. And this actually goes back to chapter 16 in this morning, which is um, geologic hazards and erosion and drainage. We often have re uh, multiple corrections from different departments on the same issues. And under state housing law, that is all supposed to be under the building department. Um, the reason that was passed that way and the intent state legislation was so it was uniform throughout the state because um, it makes it more cost effective to to build because everybody knows they're using the same code. Um, so there's a reason for that. And the county still has a fatal flaw um, in its code. And yeah, that was part of this morning. But another thing is really important is appeals, an appeals board, um, so that you have licensed professionals that people can come to when there is a disagreement. You have that prior. It was problematic. There was a lot of hostility from the planning department at that time towards the appeals board. Um, but it's still really vital to have that and have it as a quick process. Um, another suggestion is uh, septic. Septics are really takes months and months and months, you know, and that's not necessarily the county's fault in the sense that the state's involved now. But one of the things that would help is that once you have your septic consultant determine, yeah, this looks like this is going to work, allow it to be concurrent with the building process because the, the building permit process. There's some risk involved there, but there's a lot of time used while you're waiting for the state on the septic. And I think that would really help. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other public comment downstairs or online? Uh, we have eight public comments online. Uh, so. uh, have eight? We have eight of them. So uh, can they going to take you have to you have to read them yeah so all right first one is from um susie i would like to stress the waiting until pg e establishes power for temporary residents i.e trailers during reconstruction effectively shuts all, out all of the off-grid residents in the county if we didn't have pg e before and won't likely have it in the future it is important to understand how people living off-grid use generators we had a bank of solar powers, an inverter, a batter, and a battery bank. We probably used our generator three to three hours per week. Please make sure people in remote areas are allowed to use power sources that are, are, that are an alternative to PG&E. Next one is from Jacob Pollock. In regard to the item 9F and permitted structures, I would like to see residents of the affected communities be included as an integral part of the process where staff will pursue the implement, implementation of options one and two. And particularly, I would like to see community members of representatives included in all phases of the implement, implementation process from inten, intention of ideas through review and revision of the final product. This is essential because there are many unique human situations and environmental conditions that will require nuanced consideration and specific expectations. In general, every consideration should be given with regard to variances and exceptions, but the county, by the county to allow residents to return to their formal living situation. Thank you, Jacob Pollock. Next one is from Ken Davenport. Dear supervisors, the staff proposal is a good start but I encourage you to take a deeper dive. The planning director's list of damaged structures doesn't even scratch the surface of the ancillary damage that we'll face after the return home. 
smoke damage, utility problems, fire trucks driving over wells and damaging septic systems, etc. Many of the residents in the affected area are low income. Many are bringing their children back to a scary environment with unstable water. Don't burden our constituents by voting for more fees, fines, and red tape. Let these families focus on their children instead of government bureaucracy. Next one is, um, doesn't have a name. Uh, oh, this actually, so this is the one I started reading. I am a retired sign language interpreter from Last Chance. I worked for the state of California for 21 years and was looking for my retirement in the woods. My husband and I would very much like to rebuild. We appreciate all of the messages, signals we have seen from the county officials expressing the desire to streamline the rebuilding process, including provisions for, for previously unpermitted homes. The sentiments are much appreciated. In order to achieve the goals of maintaining adequate housing stock in Santa Cruz County, getting local residents back in their home and recognizing the dire circumstances being faced by rural members of Santa Cruz County, several provisions should be considered. We need a permitting process that is alternative and commensurate, and commensurate with rural properties, alternative power sources, and alternative water sources. We also would appreciate uh, reduced or zero cost permits for rebuilding as most of us have lost everything and are facing a steep uphill path to rebuilding. We are ready, we are eager, we are determined. We would appreciate some help with making the rebuilding process fit our situation and circumstances. Finally, prioritizing hazardous material cleanup prior to the winter rains would be imperative. Next one is from Rodney Robinson. As a member of the Last Chance community, we are willing to work with you to get us back to our properties. We are eager to get back to the place of our heart and our home. This is time for a creative collaboration. Please implement ways to make permitting for rural communities affordable and more effective or excuses or excuse it for rural communities that meet environmental consideration. This helps with housing crisis in our county, keeping skilled and hardworking people in the area. Consider alternative house styles, communication trans communicate transparently and provide information for cleanup. This one is from Forrest Martinez McKinney. Dear board supervisors, I am writing to you as a North Coast resident of the Last Chance community. I am also a staff research associate at the University of California, Santa Cruz, to which I have been in service for over 16 years. My family has lived on the North Coast since 1973. I was raised in the community of Last Chance, a wonderful community of land stewards who have lived in peace in our private community for decades. We are a strong, diverse, <laughs> capable group of resilient people eager to return to our land eager to return to our land. It is with sadness that my home, my father's home, my uncle's home, my mother's home, and each of my dear friends and community members lost their homes August 18th in the CZU Lightning Complex fire. Without shelter, security, or certainty of our future, I write you to express that the two options laid out by planning staff for unpermitted situations are insufficient solutions for the rural community to which they pertain. We, the community, would like to work with the county to establish another way that would facilitate rebuilding in rural communities by owners that allow for the continued use of our existing infrastructure, such as our water system, waste management system, and power system. We are eager to collaborate on creative solutions with your agency to rebuild while maintaining basic health and safety standards. We request that your staff work with community members to develop a process for rural communities that reflect the condition and the needs of, of rural communities in the county. Timeliness is crucial to the cleanup process as we hope you will prioritize communities such as ours, which will likely see adverse access conditions this winter. If, if precipitation falls on the land prior to cleanup, we risk severe contamination of our soil, waterways, drinking water source. We implore you to prioritize our community for the hazardous material cleanup and debris cleanup process. On a final note, we have been impressed by the county's responsiveness to wildfire victims by way of providing temporary shelter, food, and resources such as the Kaiser Arena at the Emmeline Warehouse and, and at the Emmeline Warehouse. We hope the same level of care will continue with the cleanup of rebuilding. <sighs> Two more. <laughs> this is from Sharon Carpenter. How do we start the cleanup process of our last chance property? We realize that using FEMA is the best. We have we have, is the best. 
way to have it certified? What is the quickest way to start the process before it starts raining? The last one is from Jessica Peters. The proposed strategies for building recovery do not go far enough. Where is the advocacy for the citizens? It appears that much of the red tape still remains. I urge you to go deeper and develop a process that others can look to in the future. And that is the end of public comment. Uh, bring it back. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mr. Mr. Chair. Yes. Mr. Supervisor. I know if there's an echo there. Um, I have a, a follow up um, question for environmental health. Um, many times there's a winter water table test requirement to confirm the need for alternative treatment systems. Uh, how will they, how will you address that? Um, is there a plan of attack at this point? Hi there, yeah. So again, if we have data that we can utilize, which oftentimes we do, we don't necessarily require it, uh, certainly, uh, so it'd be a case-by-case -case basis. But again, uh, if we have some data that we can fall back on, we use that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, any more uh, comments by the board? Or I we'll think uh, Supervisor up. Coonerty has we'll a comment. Close. Coonerty has a comment. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is uh, Supervisor Coonerty. I thought I'd uh, uh, put a motion on the table and see if we can get support. Um, so uh, I'd move the recommended actions. Uh, I'd include it and with a, an appreciation to staff um, for a really uh, comprehensive effort and um, their commitment to working to streamline the process and reduce costs for folks. Um, <clears throat> I, and then actually, let me just say, uh, there were some comments about the county profiting off this. Um, that is absolutely not true. Our, first of all, the permits uh, are just cost recovery. Second is um, in order to allow, uh, to bring in additional consultants to speed up this process, we do need some uh, revenue sources because that's what uh, these consultants will be paid from. So uh, by having um, reduced uh, but not eliminated fees, we're able to speed the process for people to get back into their homes. So it's a it's a trade off, um, but I appreciate the efforts to reduce fees. Coming back to the the motion, I'd move the uh, recommended action with the addi additional resources, uh, the additional direction that we uh, look at more resources for environmental health uh, for both well and septic uh, um, reports. Uh, that we allow uh, more than uh, one temporary um, structure uh, per property, um, that we uh, try to create a, a timeline uh, to allow people to bring functioning septic, septic systems, uh, but that it may not, that may be out of compliance up to code, uh, that we explore per Supervisor Leopold and McPherson's direction. Um, uh, drilling uh, in order to facilitate uh, uh, geotechnical testing, and five, uh, that we direct uh, environmental health and the planning staff to meet with rural community members to look at alternative uh, water and power options for those communities. I'll and second that. Requirements. I'll second that. So there's been a motion and a second. Okay. Is that all? Any other comments? Okay. We'll I'll call for a vote. Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Chair Caput? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. What we'll do now is we're going to go to uh, closed session. And that is, uh, and then we'll come back. Chair Caput, so I would recommend that's gonna take up probably at least 30 minutes to 45 minutes. So if we could return at 2.15 or 2.30 for the scheduled item, that's what I would recommend that, so. Uh, I mean, item number uh, 10. No, right. it'll be, so it'll we're be gonna, the scheduled item at 1.30. We have a scheduled item at 1.30, so we'll come back and do that item, and then we'll take up the other items on the regular agenda that we didn't get to this morning. Okay. All right. Thank you. So we're breaking until So 11. we're going to break until 2.30? Is that? 
we're, we're not going to come back at, oh, you're right. It is 1.30, right? It's 1.30 right now. Uh, and that's when we're supposed to do the appeal. We will do the appeal at 2.30. Okay. Okay. Is that all right? We can do that. Okay. For 14, uh, we're uh, going to do item number 10 later when we're done with item number 14, which is a jurisdictional hearing to consider whether to take jurisdiction of an appeal of the Planning Commission's denial of application 181024, a proposal for a coastal development permit and variances for demolition of an existing single family dwelling and construction of a new single fam family dwelling on property located on the east side of Beach Drive in Aptos planning area assessor's parcel number 0430914 and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the planning director. How you doing? Good afternoon, Nate Macbeth, Planning Department. Okay. This is a jurisdictional hearing to consider the appeal of the Planning Commission's denial of application 181024. The jurisdictional process places the burden of proof on the applicant uh, to convince your board to take jurisdiction for one or more reasons, uh, criteria outlined in county code. Those criteria include a finding that there was an error or abuse of discretion on part of the Planning Commission, zoning administrator, or other officer. There was a lack of fair or impartial hearing. Uh, there, there was a, the decision being appealed was not supported by facts presented. There was a significant new evidence that was not presented at the hearing. Or there was an error, abuse of discretion, or some other factor that renders the act or determination made unjust or inappropriate. This is the location of the proposed development. It's on the Beach Drive, just south of Beach Flats. Or, I'm sorry, um, Rio de Mar Flats in the Aptos planning area. A close up of the site, a row of homes uh, situated along Beach Drive. This is a proposal to demolish an existing single family dwelling shown here in yellow, existing site conditions, and construction of a new single family dwelling, three stories to grade approximately 120 cubic yards at the base of the coastal bluff <clears throat> and install slope stability features, including a nine and 11 foot retaining wall and a 10 foot high mesh debris fence located about midway up that bluff behind the home requires a coastal development permit and variances. Uh, acceptance of the geologic and geotechnical reports is critical uh, to determining the feasibility, siting and design of the homes in this area that are subject to geologic hazards. Geotechnical and geologic reports were submitted as part of the application process, but have not been accepted by planning staff. County code requires that acceptance of these reports uh, be done prior to a project being approved. This is a map of the floodplain affecting the site. The VE flood zone is subject to high velocity wave inundation and coastal flooding. It's also uh, subject to coastal erosion and liquefaction. <clears throat> This is a show of the topography and slope behind the home. This hope, the slope is approximately 120 feet in height. They're relatively flat at the bottom. This application was first heard by the zoning administrator on April 17th and denied for um, essentially for uh, non-acceptance of the soils and geology reports. That decision was uh, appealed to the planning commission and um, and heard by the Planning Commission on July 8th. The Planning Commission denied the appeal, uh, denied the appeal uh, based on the attached findings, revised findings for denial contained in your packet. The applicant has appealed the Planning Commission's denial to your board. The applicant submitted a letter raising a number of issues for grounds for your board to take jurisdiction. 
a response to each of these issues is contained in the attached memo. <clears throat> Based on the applicant's letter and administrative record for application 181024, staff believes the appellant has not, applicant has not shown that there's grounds to support appeal before your board. There's no indication of bias or evidence of impartiality in the record. A public hearing provided the applicant due process consistent with the protocols during a public health emergency. No new evidence has been submitted. The applicant has not shown that there are grounds to support the appeal before your board. And therefore staff recommends that your board conduct a jurisdictional hearing to consider the appeal of coastal development permit and variances application 181024 and decline to take jurisdiction of the appeal of application 181024. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Chair, I don't have any questions. Go ahead. They, no, I, I don't have any questions. Maybe you want to check with the others. Okay. Anybody? No questions? Okay. Then I think you want to uh, give 10 minutes to the uh, appellant? Yes. Uh, and then the other? Okay. Uh, I'll now, now open the hearing for comments from the appellant. The appellant will have 10 minutes to present evidence as to why the board should take jurisdiction of this matter. At the end of 10 minutes, the opposition will now then would have a total of 10 minutes. Hi. Thank you, Chair, uh, Board. Good afternoon. Uh, Robin Bolster Grant. I am the attorney for the property owners, Jim and Sue Valdania. I picked the wrong <laughs> mask to talk through. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, it, this is obviously an extraordinarily difficult time for the County of Santa Cruz. Uh, I have nothing to compare it with uh, during my 20 years as a resident, nor my 17 years as a County employee. The County faces unparalleled challenges in terms of dealing with the confluence of disasters, COVID, the budget crisis, and now the indescribable damage and loss caused by wildfire. I believe that every challenge presents an opportunity and the opportunity here is to reevaluate portions of the planning process in the county and how we might make that process work better for our community. The project that is the subject of this appeal is a case in point. The project team of engineers spent months and months in communication with the county's engineers, trying to explain their methodology and come to agreement about how to address the geologic issues on this site. The position taken by the planning staff and embraced by the zoning administrator and the planning commission is simply that the county's engineers have spoken and there is no seemingly no room for questioning their analysis. The county's evaluation of the geologic issues at this site is not one grounded specifically in the code. It is subject to industry standards of practice and based on professional experience and expertise. Contrary to the assertions made in the planning department memo to your board, the methodology used by the project engineers does not contain factual errors. Again, it is simply based on a different approach than that used by the county. Environmental planning staff and the team of project engineers, architect and geologist are equally qualified in their fields. Each team has decades of experience evaluating and mitigating geologic issues all along our coastline. And as we have said numerous times, the problem, again, the nut of the issue is simply a professional disagreement about how to evaluate these issues at this particular location. The project team is more than familiar with this specific site, having evaluated and prepared mitigations for the upper part of the bluff. Their work was accepted, permitted, inspected, and finaled by the county. Inexplicably, that prior experience and body of work is no longer considered by the county to be adequate or relevant to this project. I don't understand that. More to the point of this afternoon's hearing, the county response to our appeal simply does not address the most salient points. Neither the zoning administrator nor the planning commission based their denial on the facts presented. Several of the commissioners admitted that they did not understand the technical issues at hand, yet not a single commissioner, nor the ZA for that matter, made any attempt to flesh out the discussion by asking questions during the proceeding. The engineers were present to explain and support their methodology and recommendations. 
this seems extraordinary to me. If the decision makers did not understand the root of the conflict, why not ask the principals involved who are all available to answer questions? A review before your board acting as the building and fire code appeals board may have well accomplished the clarification needed, but that opportunity was never provided. The revised findings authored by Commissioner Guth are instructive. He went to lengths to state that the county geologist and, and environmental planning staff acted within their authority. Well, of course they have the authority, that is not in dispute. The issue is that there is wide variability within the industry about how to assess geologic and ge geotechnical issues. A comment was also made during the planning commission hearing to the effect that the county bears higher degree of liability than engineers hired by the project applicant, but of course that is not the case. The project engineers and the entire team have all staked their professional reputation and state license on their analysis and recommendations. In response to the stalemate between the respective teams of engineers, the appellant hired a neutral third party reviewer to analyze the methodology used by the project engineers. This reviewer, Alan Kropp, has decades of experience performing peer reviews up and down the state, including on behalf of a number of public agencies. In a letter provided to the zoning administrator, the county makes what I find to be an extraordinary assertion that the third party review should be discounted because the reviewer was paid by the project proponent. Not only is this somewhat insulting to the reputation of Mr. Kropp, it makes no sense given that virtually every project applicant pays for the services of one or more consultants. We can't believe that they're all paid shills and I don't believe anyone in the county truly believes that. In their memo to your board, the county revises their position on the peer review, now stating that it is irrelevant because the reports being reviewed are in error. As I stated, there's no evidence that the reports contain factual errors, only that they follow a different methodology than that used by the county. But this is also a circular argument. Mr. Kropp was brought in to assess conformance of these reports with widely accepted industry standards. Yet his review is ignored to a certain extent because the reports have errors. The whole point of a peer review would be to identify errors. Uh, peer review of technical reports is widely used by many jurisdictions throughout the state and the country. In the attachments to my appeal letter to your board, I, dev uh, I provided information about that peer review process and guidelines uh, developed by the California Geotechnical Engineers Association that explain the need and the benefits of this process. If I may read from the guidelines, quote, the geotechnical reviewer should recognize that geotechnical engineering is characterized by diverse opinions among the various geotechnical professionals. Oftentimes, no singular valid opinion or interpretation is possible given the diversity of experience and background of the professionals involved. These are not my words, these come from the association. This completely contradicts the notion put forward by the county that the technical reports are an error. Again, they simply reflect a different professional interpretation. Uh, it's worth pointing out that in the previous session, your board raised the possibility of hiring outside geotechnical engineers and other professionals to help the county navigate the tremendous need for such professionals in addressing the efforts to rebuild and repair hundreds of homes throughout the county. So it is obviously not out of the realm of possibility for the county to reach out to private consultants for technical assistance. The memo to your board also refutes our, asso our assertion that the planning commission based their denial in part on a number of variances that are included in the proposal. However, the final comments made by several planning commissioners reveal that their decision was based in large part on variances and other design issues having to do with height. One commissioner stated that the entire project represents quote, a huge overreach. It wasn't made clear what that comment referred to, but I can only assume that it had to do with the number of variances requested. Of course, these types of variances are routinely requested and approved up and down that part of our coastline. Design issues were not raised during the project review and were not the subject of the findings for denial. The appellants were never given a chance to respond to the question of variances or height or any other design considerations. I also wanna to briefly touch on the issue raised regarding the failure to adhere to the Permit Streamlining Act. The board memo states that this issue is moot because the county responded to the applicant's completeness appeal by deeming the project complete. Because the issue has been arising with more frequency on other projects, I do think it's important to just say, 
simply deeming a project complete rather than holding a formal appeal hearing before your board does nothing to address the underlying issue. What was the basis for finding the project incomplete in the first instance? This is a problem with the process that cannot be fixed without a full impartial hearing. An incomplete determination made in error can add months to permit processing time, which serves no one. A number of other issues raised in our appeal letter did not receive a response, including our contention that the Planning Commission hearing was not impartial. I believe anyone listening to the recorded proceeding will find that the comments made by the commission indicate otherwise. Again, referring to the project as a whole as a huge overreach, or we know what happens with that bluff, Again, the basis for these comments was not made explicit. There was no discussion or opportunity to refute or clarify what that meant. Um, clearly though, the, these assertions were based for at least one commissioner denial um, without being supported by the facts presented. We ask that your board take jurisdiction and allow for a thorough, fair and impartial hearing on this project, including the efficacy of using third party reviewers as many other California jurisdictions do. We ask that if questions are to be raised concerning design issues, that the discussion provides the appellant and their architect a chance to respond to these concerns. Simply deferring to planning staff recommendations without fleshing out the underlying conflict begs the question, why have an appeal process? I do wanna finally say that I hate being here. I hate being in this position. I know the planning department staff really well, and I truly respect their dedication to protecting the public health and welfare. But I believe the planning process broke down in several respects in this case, and I hope that you will give us the opportunity to get this project back on track. We've offered to have the county bring in yet another third party reviewer. We maintain that that would be the best for all involved. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Is there another side, uh, council? No. So now we would either take questions or uh, we would uh, uh, take testimony. Yeah. Anybody here? Yes, you could open it up for public comment at this point or ask for uh, questions from the board. Are there any questions from the board? Uh, we are gonna have the opposition speak though, right? There's no opposition uh, to this project uh, uh, as far as we're aware at the moment, um, at least for purposes of this hearing. Okay. Um, so so I, you would uh, ask for public if, comment next. If I have a question now, I'll ask it. That would be okay. great. That would be great. All right, I just didn't want to jump in front of somebody. Uh, is, what was, Refresh my memory. When was when was the uh, the, the home that's there now uh, originally built? I believe it was the early 1960s. 1960s. I believe so. Yes. Okay. And it survived the big storms that we had in the 1970s at some time, uh, where the high tide came <coughs> in. Yeah, uh, storms of 82, early 1980s. Yeah, um, yeah. as far as I'm aware, it survived. I don't have a damage okay. assessment from that time. And would a home now be allowed to be built uh, with the current restrictions that we have now on uh, beach homes? Um, could, could Let's you say it was clarify. an empty lot. Mm -hmm. would, would somebody be able to build there now? Uh, yes, I believe so. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's just several other vacant lots along that stretch that have been recently developed in the last 10 years. And that's only because of the current, uh, well, I, I know with the Coastal Commission, they're much more strict now on, on homes on the beach. So if it wasn't being built on the current site, uh, the Coastal Commission is not allowing homes to be built uh, like they were in the 1960s. Correct, there's a number of um, constraints that are now affecting the site mapping for these, uh, for, for instance, the flood mapping has been updated. Right. Uh, so the base flood elevation has risen over time and regulations pertaining development in those areas has become more restrictive. Yeah, and I guess the, with the backyard, back area, 
uh, it's uh, it's so steep there. It's really it goes basically uh, uh, at a very high angle. Uh, is that is that soil uh, stable back there? Do we know that? Because uh, I know in storms, a lot of uh, land like that will shear off. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would have to defer that question to um, either the county staff, uh, geologist, or maybe the applicant's uh, representative to determine the, the, the stability of that, but it is an area of frequent uh, slope instability. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the high tide comes how close uh, during a, a king tide, I guess, during the winter? How Does it come right up to the doorstep? Do a large storm event could come up to the doorstep of this home, yes. Okay. Uh, any other comments, questions from the board? Uh, if not, we can give another five minutes to... Well, you want to see if there's public comment. At this point, you would take public comment. Public comment. Um, there won't be a need for a five-minute uh, reply because no there was need. no opposition. Right. Are there any members of the public who wish to, uh, to address the board on this item? Each person will have three minutes to speak. Please keep your comments to the question of whether the board should take jurisdiction of this matter. Anyone downstairs? Anyone online? Okay. Uh, that concludes the public hearing on uh, item number 14. The public hearing is now closed. I will bring it back to the board for discussion and action uh, and whether or not there's a motion and a second. And it's open now. We'll, we'll go with uh, Supervisor McPherson. You want to go first? I have no comments on it. Thank you. But Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Chair. You know, I, I appreciate the information from staff as well as the information from Ms. Bolster Grant, you know, in order for us to take jurisdiction, there are very specific findings that need to be made. I don't believe that uh, in this case, any of those uh, are warranted. So I believe that the board shouldn't take jurisdiction and I do support uh, the staff recommendation. And Supervisor Coonerty, Supervisor Leopold. I agree with uh, Supervisor Friend. Okay, so uh, if we have uh, if we open it up for a motion and the second right now, I, I guess we already had the motion and second, or we did. I didn't hear the I'll motion. It happens. Okay. Uh, I would second it. All right. Second by Supervisor Leopold on item number 14. And if the clerk will conduct a roll call vote. Call for the vote. Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Chair Caput? Aye. Uh, the motion passes unanimously. That brings us to the end of today's. No, we, we have, we have, the, uh, we got to go back to item yeah, 10. Chair Caput, uh, we have to go the back. The meeting will uh, start back up uh, with item nice number try. 10. Nice <laughs> try. <laughs> okay. This is item 10, which is consider adoption of an emergency ordinance to provide protection for price gouging in goods, service, and property rentals as a result of the CZU August lightning complex fires, as well as future emergencies, as recommended by Supervisors Coonerty and McPherson. There's an emergency ordinance and amendments to the county code. Okay. Maybe either uh, Supervisor we'll McPherson. Have the supervisor's presentation. I don't know whether it was Supervisor McPherson or Supervisor Coonerty want to introduce. Well, I don't know. I, I, Ryan might, but uh, you know, we need to. Uh, we really need to protect the community and these circumstances from those who would uh, profit, so to speak, from misfortune. And I think next to looting, which I think we've had about a dozen cases of, this is probably the lowest uh, that you can go. Um, I I think that we should. Uh, Pass this ordinance to, uh, it's a matter of uh, public protection 
and uh, to let let those who would want to take advantage of some others uh, under distress that we're not going to stand for it. So um, that's my statement, and I will be glad to make the motion to approve that. But uh, you might want to get public comment first, please. But I'll, I'll be yeah. glad to second that. I th I thought of this uh, uh, about three or four weeks ago, and. Um, at the time, uh, there may have been some that were gouging. I'm not sure if they're still trying to do that, but uh, yeah, uh, this is uh, a sad situation. Uh, Chair, I just had one question for sure. council. Does this cover contracting services? It, it covers contracting services as mentioned in here. Okay. So if it's for purposes of rebuilding, uh, cleanup, uh, specific things related to that, it covers that. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Any other uh, uh, questions of board members on this item? Uh, call. I will call for well, public Well, you want to see if there's uh, members of the public want to say. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I will now call for the public comment on this item. Hey, good to see you again. That looks like my pen. Um, I was here several weeks ago and this was brought up for consideration. I, it seems great to hold people accountable. Um, I'll be brief, I just think that's good. I guess I wanna personally thank everybody who's in the room. Mr. McPherson, McPherson, you said some really constructive stuff. Oh my gosh, I've got a lot on my mind, but I just appreciate a lot that you share today and you too, Mr. Leopold. So I'll be brief, thank you, I'm going to lunch. You See you guys again. Hey, thanks a lot, man. Okay, anybody else uh, would like to speak? Anyone downstairs no. or online? No, there's nobody downstairs and there are no web comments. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, somebody coming in, no? No, I think. Okay, that concludes public comment on item number four, or no, item number 10. Bring it back to the board for your motion and uh, Supervisor McPherson. Okay, and I'll second that. I'll, uh, I'll okay, second. there was a there was a motion that we couldn't hear from. So uh, he was on mute. So Supervisor McPherson, could you please uh, take yourself off mute and then maybe <laughs> restate your motion? Yes, sir. Yeah, excuse me, I didn't think you wanted to hear everything I had to say. But I <laughs> to adopt the search of the ordinance. <laughs> okay, so you have the motion, I have the second. So we're ready I'll for call for the vote now. <laughs> Supervisor Leopold. Aye. Bren. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Chair Caffet. Aye. Post the motion passes unanimously. Now we're jumping right away. We're moving here to number 11. Consider resolution authorizing hotel stays longer than 30 days in response to the local emergency created by the CZU. August lightning complex fires as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. Oh, good afternoon, Chair Kappa and members of the board. Um, so as you know, in the middle of August, we had the CZU lightning complex fires break out and thousands of Santa Cruz County residents were forced to evacuate their homes as a result of the fires. We've been able to repopulate a, a, a number of areas, but we still have about 2,000 people in our county who are staying in hotels, either in this county or outside our county. Um, we also, because of the emergency, have had a large number of first responders who've been having to stay in hotels in our county. To the extent these individuals are currently residing in hotels, the item before you is an effort to ensure that they may remain staying in their current location without violating zoning regulations or use permit restrictions limiting the length of stays. So the, the resolution before you is an emergency regulation, re regulation that would allow many hotels and other short-term lodging businesses and developments um, to allow stays longer than 13 days. So if you have any questions, um, me or County Council are happy to answer them. Okay, are there any questions from board members? Uh, Mr. Chair, yep. uh, Supervisor McPherson, I, I just wanted to uh, thank the 
uh, CAO for bringing this to our attention. Uh, the shelters operated by the county and the Red Cross uh, in the immediate aftermath of the virus have been truly outstanding. And uh, uh, our own Jillian Ritter, our executive secretary uh, at the county board of supervisors office uh, has been at the lead of this and she and so many others have helped in this implementation of this. Um, and I, I, I wanna just uh, really, I think we need to really highlight um, and be thankful for our, our lodging community uh, being a critical partner in our recovery process here uh, in Santa Cruz County. As was mentioned, I think there's just about 2000 people now being uh, um, housed in uh, hotel and motel rooms throughout the county. Uh, a, a really a phenomenal effort and offering by the hotel, uh, our hotel partners um, for um, really helping those in need and uh, prior, or prioritizing them above guests uh, from out of town when possible. Uh, so uh, this, this industry has been hard hit by COVID-19 itself, but they're just taking another step forward. And I really appreciate their sense of public health protection um, also offered, and I want to mention this, about a campaign that they are, are um, leading now. It's called Let's Cruise Safely, and it is very, very uh, um, focused on if visitors come here, they want to say, this is what we, we are doing. We are prioritizing safety measures, uh, face masks, social distancing, and so forth. Uh, they are really making it a point that when you come here, that's what you're going to have to follow in our county. And uh, I can't say enough, uh, I'm a member of the board of the Visit Santa Cruz County. Uh, they really thought about this uh, very deeply and I think it's important that we continue to have them in, as partners and let them survive as best possible under the circumstances. But um, first and foremost, I wanna thank them for providing or allowing us to use so many of their hotel motel rooms. And then for uh, really, uh, offering a really responsible let's cruise safely program that's very well done uh, and i i really uh, want to say thank you in, in more ways than one to the lodging industry for their help in this situation that we're in today and i would like to make uh, uh, the motion that um, we uh, pass this emergency regulation um, authorizing longer stay uh, term stays and hotel stays in our our community in our county I'll second, um, and I'll add to Mr. Chair, and I, there may be people in the community that want to address this on this item too, and I appreciate Supervisor McPherson's comments as well as his service on, on that board, uh, but the, the local lodging industry did reach out to us because they do have uh, some individuals that are looking, that are fire evacuees as, as well as some public safety first responders, as Ms. Coburn said, uh, that intend to stay longer than 30 days uh, we recognize that that um, we want to make it as smooth as possible for people uh, that are trying that are dealing with this remarkably difficult time and this should help provide uh, at least a continuity of a location through the end of the year that i think would be very important so i appreciate the quickness by which county staff turned this around you bet. any other board uh, comments i i support this uh, effort as well Okay, I'll, I'll just say uh, personally, uh, when you look at this, it's an example of how close all of us are to being uh, homeless. And uh, most of us are not the typical homeless case. Uh, most of us uh, have a home, we have a place. I know uh, with my family, uh, I, I have friends that would maybe take my, uh, myself and my wife and maybe one kid or something in but if I showed up with my whole family and also uh, occasionally when my mother-in-law's with us, uh, I don't know any, even any of my friends that could take all eight of us. So uh, we'd have to go to a hotel. I understand that totally, or I'd have to go to the fairgrounds. And uh, it's a real tough situation and we need this in order to get through. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, uh, you wanna see if there's any public comment? Yeah. Any, uh, any public comment? None? And we have no web comments either. So if you'd like, I can t call okay. for the vote. Yeah. Thank you. Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? 
Aye. And Chair Caput. Aye. Thank motion you. passes unanimously. Takes us to item number 12, consider approval of the measure D five-year plan for 2020 and 2021 fiscal year and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the deputy CAO uh, director and the director of public works. Measure D. Uh, any questions from the board? Well, why don't we give hear the presentation? Yes. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon, Chair. I know, I know it's been a long oh, there, marathon day for y'all. Okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah, good afternoon, Chair, and the rest of the board members listening in, um, CAO and County Council, yeah. and members of the public. Uh, my name is Steve Wiesner. I'm the Assistant Director of Public Works uh, in the Transportation Division. Here today with me is Casey Carlson, uh, Casey is a senior civil engineer. He's in charge of our pavement management program <clears throat> for the unincorporated area of the county. And uh, today I'm gonna be giving uh, uh, hopefully a very brief update um, to our Measure D program. This is our five-year uh, program. And we do this every year. So, um, and as you are, all are very aware, um, the county, uh, our voters passed a half a cent sales tax measure um, in November 2, 2016. And uh, that gave us a 30 year funding source for various transportation needs countywide. Um, counties, uh, the county's share, annual share of that uh, is estimated right now to be approximately 2.3 million. Now it's a, it's a fairly considerable drop from what we've been estimating uh, around 3 million a year uh, before the impacts of COVID. So um, we're seeing revenues drop um, and that is factored into this uh, new five-year plan. Um, and as part of the five-year plan, uh, the annual requirements include um, the county producing a five-year plan uh, that's approved in a public hearing. So that's why we're here today. Um, when we, when right after the sales uh, tax measure was passed, um, we did a polling of, of various communities within the unincorporated areas of our, our county, and the top three priorities they continue to be uh, maintaining our county roadways um, and specifically in, in neighborhoods. So we've been working on that quite a bit. There we go. Okay. So. All right, so what I'm gonna do is just go through just a little smattering very quickly of some of the work. Um, this is our third year of implementing projects uh, utilizing Measure D funds. And so over the last couple of years, we are able to get quite a bit of work done, um, various areas around the county. So you're just gonna see a few little before and after pictures of some of the projects we've completed um, in District 1, um, Supervisor Leopold's district. We did some work up on Miller Hill, some work down in the Live Oak neighborhood. Uh, District 2, we're able to complete some, some good projects in the La Selva area and in the Rio Del Mar area. In District 3, um, we've been uh, focusing on Martin Road for the first couple of years of the program. And in District 4, um, uh, Supervisor Caput, and this is your district, the, the first couple of years of funding we used to repair a critical bridge on Casserly Road, which I know you're aware of, and then we're working towards other projects in your district as well, um, Lakeview being one of them. And last but not least, uh, never least is District 5. And um, we've been able to complete um, some really good uh, projects in the downtown Boulder Creek core area and also in the Ben Lomond downtown core area. Um, and so what we've actually been working on this year, I'm just gonna go over a few of the projects that we have going this year. Um, in District 1, we're able to start uh, working on Thurber area. Now, you're gonna see some of these befores. We haven't taken any afters, but a lot of these neighborhoods actually are looking pretty good. Um, we, because of the fire, we had a little bit of a standstill on some of the contracting work countywide, um, but you probably see in most of these neighbors that actually already been paved over. And in District 2, um, we were able to get quite a bit of uh, downtown Sea Cliff area. Um, at District 3, we're actually reserving a couple years worth of funds so that we can do a significant project out on Swanton Road. And in District 4, we've been working on Lakeview and again, last but not least, uh, we've been able to complete quite a bit of work in the downtown Felton area. Um, and so uh, what this plan, what this, this year's update, it's a little bit different from years past um, um, because we are seeing a loss in revenue um, that we can expect probably for the next several years, at least that's what we're hearing from the RTC. Um, What we've done now is we've looked at the current construction costs and we've looked at what um, our revenues are expected for the next several years. And we've determined that basically we can complete um, the existing five-year plan in the next four years. Um, and so the existing list of roads that you've seen that have been ongoing on this list for the last few years, um, we think we can get done 
through 2024. And so what we've done is we've taken the current numbers and we've looked at what we think we can do um, for the next five years after that. And we've uh, given the uh, existing construction costs um, and what we think our revenues are gonna be. We've worked basically with every district very closely um, with both the supervisors and your aides to, to look at what the priorities are in each district. And we've come up with what we think is a good list of roads that'll be for an additional five years. And so what this in essence will do, will take us through to 2029. Now, we know that construction costs vary from year to year as do revenues. And so we try to only project out in the, in the plan what we can do for the next year. And so you'll see it's, it's attached to, to your, your board memo, um, our actual plan. And then there's a list of roads and you should recognize those roads because we work very, very closely with your, with your teams to identify these roads. What you see highlighted in green is what we think we're gonna be able to do the next year. Um, what you see in black is, is what was part of the original plan that we think we can get done in the next four years. And then what you'll see in blue and italicized is, is the additional five years worth of roadways. Um, now, we, we like putting more roads on this list than less because it, it gives us an opportunity should other funding sources become available, um, uh, we can capture that opportunity in roads that we've already vetted through, looked at our pavement management system and decided these really need to be done. All right, so that's my presentation. Um, the recommended, recommended actions you have before you are to adopt the attached Measure D five-year plan for this fiscal year, the 2021 fiscal year, and authorize Public Works to submit a copy of the approved board package to the Regional Transportation Commission. And so with that, and in the spirit of brevity, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. But we're also ready to just go home. <laughs> you bet. So. Thanks a lot. You bet. Chair, I would just uh, say, uh, due to the wisdom of the voters, uh, they supported Measure D, and it now gives us a very clear uh, map uh, about uh, what's gonna be done. These five-year plans that we do annually um, really do help uh, constituents see what's coming up in terms of uh, road repair. And when we look about the additional uh, miles that we're able to do, as we set out in our strategic plan, uh, I think to get 12 miles done a year in the county. Um, that's a big increase from what we had just five years ago. And so um, <clears throat> uh, in public investment works, we're working to get more work done. And as the um, revenues from Measure D continue to increase, uh, we'll get more work done. But right now uh, we have to scale back our expectations why the, the sales tax numbers are low but I really appreciate the work and I appreciate the way that you work with our staff uh, uh, in my office, I'm sure all of our offices, to make sure that we're picking up the roads that are in most greatest need. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other board members have questions? Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, this is Supervisor McPherson. I just can't let a road um, related um, uh, something go by without thanking the voters in November of 2016, two, more than two thirds of them approving this half cent sales tax for 30 years. Uh, I think as much as anything, people appreciate the improvements they have witnessed in the last few years uh, on our roads. And we have, I think about 600 miles of uh, county um, roadways in our, um, in our county. And for the fifth district in particular, thanks for the attention you've played, uh, taken uh, to Boulder Creek, Ben Loman and Felton. Um, we, we need to recognize the um, damage caused by the uh, lightning complex fire. Uh, I, I, I think to our roadways, it wasn't as serious as I feared, uh, but I don't know what anybody was thinking it might be, but uh, uh, unfortunately with uh, the COVID uh, that has a dampening effect on revenue projections that we might have had prior to uh, this last spring with the COVID pandemic. Uh, we're not going to be able to do as much as we might have thought about a year ago, but uh, we're still going to move ahead. And uh, I, I think if we get, as we get um, further into the rebuilding process, uh, we may need to revise this Measure D list of projects to accommodate uh, lo the local match for uh, fiery, fire damaged roads, but um, uh, thank you to Mr. Wiesner, the Public Works Department, uh, everybody, they've really worked hard and they're, they're continuing their work, uh, even in some of these crises that we're facing from COVID to fires, uh, we're getting some road work done and uh, it's to their credit. And I think this roadmap literally 
uh, excuse the pun, to where we're going and what we're headed and why we're going there for some of the he more heavily tra traveled roads is uh, really, really a, a convenient proposal that the uh, the general public can see uh, what's been done and what is coming. So thank you very much to the Public Works Department. Thank you. Any other board comments? If none, I'll just uh, also th say thank you. I know it's a really trying time. It's really difficult. Uh, we'd all like to have more money for our districts, but uh, uh, thank you for what you're doing for my district and everybody else uh, in their areas right now, especially in the fire area. So. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to add um, appreciation to the roads crew for being out there in the uh, impacted areas, replacing bridges and culverts. Um, I really appreciate their efforts to to make it safe for, uh, for areas that are already damaged. You bet. Okay. Uh, we'll open it up uh, now for public comment. Uh, anybody, anywhere? No, there is no public comment. Chair, I would uh, move the recommended actions. Okay. Second. Got a first and second by Supervisor Leopold and second by McPherson. Um, go ahead uh, and call conduct for the, the roll call. <laughs> Supervisor Leopold. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Chair Caput. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And then now we'll go to number 13. Consider the final appointment of Laura Segura to the Commission on Justice and Gender as an at-large representative of Monarch Services for a term to expire uh, April 1, 2020, and uh, the nomination uh, was accepted okay. September 1st uh, of this year. Uh, I want to welcome her. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll all vote for her. And I would move uh, approval. Thank you. We have a first. I'll second. I'll go ahead and second. Okay. She's uh, my appointment, actually. And would you like me to call for the vote? Well, maybe just see if there's anybody out there who wants to make any comments. Seeing none, <laughs> maybe we can call the vote. <laughs> Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Chair Caput? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. And that brings us to the, uh, the end of today's agenda. The meeting will be adjourned. Our next special meeting of the Board of Supervisors will be 9 a.m. Tuesday, September 29th. Thank you.